Recording in progress. Right. <coughs> I'm not sure. I'm just like horribly dry in the middle. <laughs> hmm. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Hello and welcome to the Capitola Planning Commission meeting. This meeting is open to the public with both in-person attendance at the City of Capitola Council Chambers at 420 Capitola Avenue and remote attendance possible. Planning Commission and staff are attending in person and remotely via Zoom. There are several ways to <clears throat> for the public to watch and participate. Information on how to join the meeting via Zoom and make public comment during the meeting is available on our website, cityofcapitola.org, on the meeting agenda. The public can also live stream the meeting on the city's website or on YouTube. As always, this meeting is cablecast live on Spectrum Communications, Cable TV Channel 8, and AT&T U-verse Channel 99, and is being recorded to be rebroadcast on the following Mondays and Fridays, 1 p.m. on Spectrum Channel 71 and Spectrum Channel 25. <clears throat> Excuse me. A recording of the meeting will also be available on the city's website after the meeting. Our, our technician tonight is Walter, and as a reminder, please turn off your cell phones during the meeting. Hmm. <coughs> and the horse. <laughs> um, and so, moving on, we need the roll call on the Pledge of Allegiance. Or All right. Commissioner Westman. Here. Commissioner Wilk. Here. Vice Chair Chris, uh, Jensen, excuse me. Present. And Chair Christensen. Here. <laughs> Commissioner SD is absent. <laughs> okay, moving on to item two, additions and deletions to the agenda. There are no additions or deletions to the agenda. However, we are going to ask that we reorder the topics tonight to begin with topic number four. Okay, and um, item three is oral communications. Oral communications allows time for members of the public to address the planning commission on any consent item on tonight's agenda. <clears throat> or on any topic within the jurisdiction of the city that is not on the public hearing section of the agenda. Members of the public may speak up for three minutes, for up to three minutes, unless otherwise specified by the chair. Individuals may not speak more than once during oral communications. All speakers must address the entire legislative body and will not be permitted to engage in dialogue. 
a, a maximum of 30 minutes is set aside for oral communications. Is there anybody wish to speak? <laughs> If you could put your name on. Hi, my name is Goran Klopic. I live here locally in Santa Cruz County. What I'm uh, about to tell today is uh, that there is a certain police corruption here in the county going on. I, I'm not sure, I cannot uh, prove it yet, but I'm talking about uh, drug trafficking and prostitution. I talked about that to a captain here in Capitola and uh, I didn't hear back from her. Mm. I, I'm not I'm not sure how to go on from here. I I'm having problems with uh, other deputies because I've been uh, talking about uh, certain issues here, not the CPD, but other deputies from other counties who are uh, harassing me. So I'm not sure about that either. What I can do. Uh, thank you very much for listening. God bless you all. Take care. Thank you very much. Anybody else like to speak? Is there anybody on Zoom? Or do we take? Oh, okay. Um, number f item four is planning commission and staff comments. But, or we're um, replacing number four, removing something. Oh, I'm sorry. So. Topic four within the regular um, section 6A. So no changes for this number four. So planning commission staff comments. Staff has no comments this evening. <laughs> Actually, I have two comments. Uh, city council next week. There are, um, um, they will also be discussing the housing element update and future, the request for the 75 feet at the mall. And they will also be discussing the strategic plan. There were questions that came up at our last planning commission on that, so I would encourage you all to tune in. The staff report will be published tomorrow with more information on the strategic plan. And it uh, sounds like it's gonna be a very, um, a lot of stakeholder outreach. The planning commissioners will all be involved in the process, but uh, Chloe is the project manager on that. Um, assistant to the city manager and she'll be giving an overview on that so I would suggest that you all tune in and also that the zero emission passenger rail and trail there'll be a presentation on that to the city council next week so a lot of planning um, discussions that I would stay tuned okay thank you thank you okay um I can um so I just want to um, say thanks for this workshop because I think some of my comments last meeting were perhaps a little bit um, controversial. I didn't mean to, when I was talking about landscaping and some of these things, I didn't mean to undermine staff or the direction they gave to um, the applicant. Obviously, that's their job to interpret the code and, and give a good direction, which they did. Just because I have trouble understanding some of the rules in the gray areas and think I need a workshop doesn't mean that uh, staff isn't telling the applicant what they need to hear. So I apologize if for any confusion there. Thank you. Um, okay, anything else? Any commission comments? Nope. Okay. Um, moving on to the consent calendar. Uh, all matters listed under the consent calendar are considered by the Planning Commission to be routine and will be enacted by one motion in the form listed below. There will be no separate discussion on these items prior to the time of Planning Commission votes on the actions unless Planning Commission requests specific items to be discussed for separate review. 
Items pulled for separate discussion will be considered in the order listed on the agenda. Item A, uh, approval of December 7th, 2023 Planning Commission meeting minutes. You want to do A and B together? Yeah, let's do that. I, I move approval of the meeting minutes for 12-7-2023 and 1-18-2024. A first and a second. Roll call. Commissioner Wilk. Aye. Vice Chair Jensen. Aye. And Chair Christensen. Aye. Um, moving on to items or uh, item six public hearing. Public hearings are intended to provide an opportunity for public discussion of each item listed as a public hearing. The following procedure is as follows. One, first is staff presentation. Second is planning commission questions. Third, public comment. Fourth, planning commission deliberation. And fifth, the fi fifth decision, excuse me. Um, item A, we have the citywide zoning code update. The project description is for future amendments to the Capitola Municipal Code title 17 zoning the future zoning code ordinance amendments will impact the development standards and regulation for properties citywide the zoning code is part of the city's local coastal program and amendments require certification by the california coastal commission prior to taking effect in the coastal zone recommended action provide feedback to staff on zoning discussion items and direct staff to prepare, prepare an ordinance to amend capitola municipal code title 17 zoning um, thank you, Chair Christensen. I'm going to jump into the work session. So tonight we're having a work session on just a few uh, um, planning documents and roles. Then we're going to we're planning to go into the zoning code update topics and just items that the planning commission had identified at our last meeting that they'd like to talk about, and then broader planning discussion items. Um, we're going to switch around the schedule here and start off with the zoning code update topics, um, at least the first topic of the mall. And then after that, I'll look to the planning commission to see if I think we should probably at that point start at the beginning of the presentation. Um, I am wondering if, do we have Ben Noble on the line? We do. Okay, so Ben Noble is joining us from Ben Noble Planning. He has um, historically helped us with updates to the planning code, whenever a zoning code. So um, is Ben an active panelist at this point? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So yeah, if at any time you see Ben raise his hand or however we want to, he, he might jump into the conversation as well as he knows Capitola very well. Um, So mall redevelopment and incentives. I actually, I added this uh, to our agenda after hearing the items that the Planning Commission wanted to discuss because it's uh, a kind of a pressing item under our housing element currently with the last letter that we received from the state. Um, and we have identified within our housing element update a commitment to updating the section of code, which is for incentives for community benefits. Currently, this section um, includes, it establishes which incentives are allowed in exchange for community benefits. Mall redevelopment is has its own uh, section within this code, and mall redevelopment qualifies as a community benefit. The current incentives are an increased height from 40 feet within the regional commercial up to 50 feet as the incentive, and the floor area ratio can increase from 1.5 to 2.0. Um, so within the housing element, we have identified 645 housing units on the merlon Geyer properties within the mall. There's more on the mall as a whole, but 645 within the merlon Geyer portion. Um, and it's important to know that within the merlon Geyer property, they have long-term leases on portions of that land. So when we look at the overall square footage that merlon Geyer owns, in this next housing cycle, they're not able to develop on top of the coals. They're not able to develop on the parking next to the target, target parking lot. They're also not able to redevelop uh, by the entryway of Macy's that is on the interior of the mall. 
So when you do the math, when you back it out, it's a much smaller land area than what you see when you look at their total number for the property. So of the 645 units that are identified in the housing element, 419 of those units are for affordable units. We worked with our housing consultant. We looked at the smaller size of the lot based on the long-term leases. And we found, the consultant found that it is feasible within the 50 feet um, to build 645 units. However, when you look at the economics of the site, it is it may not be economically feasible um, to develop uh, with 419 affordable units. So additional development is likely necessary to make this project economically feasible. Um, so there has we've received several letters throughout the housing element update with a request from the mall owner to look at increasing the height up to 75 feet um, and also um, when we did our the math of increasing the height to 75 feet, this would result in somewhere between 1,000 to 1,300 units based on um, whether or not the, the floor, first floor commercial, and utilizing an equation that's provided by the state HCD for, we have no density on that property. So um, the mall is also within their letters, they've asked for um, an exception within the floor area ratio to not count the parking garages. Um, and right now, as things are continue to change at the state level regarding parking and being next to a high frequency transit area, it's most likely that parking in the long run will not be required at the mall by the state um, as, our, as the frequencies of our transit increase. Um, so this exception request could be a great incentive for the mall to produce more parking than is required in the future. Um, and then the other thought to keep in mind is that the, the visual impacts of height and parking garages, they can be mitigated through our objective design standards. I think that's maybe something we also need to just fine tune thinking about uh, going to greater height. Um, so I have a series of slides that I got out to you early, so I know you've seen these, I don't wanna uh, and too much time going over the projects, but 50 Fel Felker Streets, it's 63 feet high, five stories and 35 units. This is 130 Center Street, it's 74 feet in height, so this is similar to the request by the mall. It's six stories tall. There's 233 units. These are all single room occupancy units, and they do have commercial on the ground floor. Here's a side view uh, of note is when you're when you're building to 75 feet or these taller structures with re, um, retail on the ground floor, typically like a minimum of 15 feet is what you would see on that ground floor level when it's commercial. And sometimes you would see upwards of over 20 feet on the ground level, like 18 to 20. Um, this is 324 Front Street, Cruise Hotel, it's 75 feet tall. So again, it's the equivalent of what's being asked for at the mall. 75 feet tall, six stories, 232 rooms. And again, you can see that um, ground floor commercial and they've actually parked it under the, underneath. Yeah, the red line is the grade on that one. Next, I've included a slide for the Capitola Mall. This is from the 2019 conceptual review. And this um, view is at 75 feet where you're seeing the top of the roof, um, six stories with one story of commercial and within the Capitola Mall the overall project was 637 units and then this is just another angle of the Capitola Mall here it's um, 75 feet seven stories on this side is this was the street that was the extension of 38th Avenue that would go through the residential portion not showing the commercial to the left you can see a garage door on the left bottom uh, corner this uh, for that building in this previous slide also, there's parking um, wrapped by this building. So you can't see the parking garage and it's wrapped with residential and commercial. Um, 820 Pacific Avenue, this one goes up to 80 feet, seven stories in height and 85 units. Again, it has a, a ground floor. I think the first two floors of this are commercial and office space. 
And here again, you're seeing those a 16 foot height on the first story and then 12 feet for the office and then going up with 10 foot heights. Uh, 100 Laurel Street, this measures at 82 feet, um, seven stories tall with 205 units, again, ground floor commercial. And here's the, they also have underground parking. And then 530 Front Street goes up to 89 feet, eight stories, 276 units, as well as about 7,000 units of commercial. And here, a 15-foot ground floor commercial with this building. So um, the second part of the request was for the floor FAR, sorry, FAR exception for the parking garages. Uh, I was just going to walk you through the previous mall design where you see the two cars is where the garages are. Um, the top garage that was closer to Target, um, one wall of that was not wrapped. And on the lower garage, the building I already showed you, uh, the building it wasn't entirely wrapped for around their garage. Um, so these are just a, showing the differences, the comparisons of a wrapped building versus one that you can see is visible. The, on the lower slide, you can actually see this two-story Target parking garage. That's that red line. It's the second story of the Target garage and then the unwrapped. So I think in moving forward with this request, we would want to think about um, if we were to make an exception to it, just that it be integrated into the design of the building so that um, just the context of it is, is the, the, what's shown on the top is achieved. Um, so the Planning Commission discussion tonight is for the increased incentives for the mall site uh, with a request of maximum building height to 75 feet, floor area ratio exception. Tonight I'm not looking for a vote. There is not an ordinance in front of you. There is not a housing element update in front of you. This is a work session item. Um, I just, in preparation of where we go next with our housing element, this feedback um, will help direct that um, of, of what we come back for options. But at this point for the housing element, we're working on drafts and the state HCD is really asking us to commit to a number in our housing element. And I will only do that with the support of my planning commission and city council. So um, that's why I'm bringing this to you tonight and I welcome the discussion. And again, there's no vote and this is, You want to talk to us first before we can talk about this? Or? Sure. Hi there. My name is Dave Geyser. I'm the Managing Director of Design and Construction from Low Iron Partner. I've been with the firm for over 25 years. Um, I was a participant with Kathy and uh, others uh, bringing the original proposal forward back in 2019, I think was the last time we met. Um, the We have been participating or wanting to participate in the housing element process. That's why we've been presenting letters to what we changes we think need to be made um, in order for us to process you know, the number of, kind of number of units that we're talking about. In fact, these are even greater numbers than we were proposing originally. And so we, we thought that there need to be changes made to the zoning to allow for such development. I would honestly, candidly say that the proposal that we had in 2019, to keep in mind, that's not the proposal proposal today that we're bringing forward. We don't have an application today. And so we're, I would say that we would likely, especially given some of the comments we received at the end of 2019 about integration of other uh, amenities to the site and other design issues, that we would probably go back, not totally to the drawing board, but we would re-envision the site with the zoning um, that was, if it's changed, what that says and what that allows us to do today. And also the different economic conditions today. Retail's changed a little bit, office changed greatly, the retail landscape in general has changed quite a bit, and our economic situation has changed a little bit with our interest rates and where we're going with the economy. Things have changed. The, the landscape has changed for development. So I just say keep that in mind that we're not asking you, we're asking for zoning flexibility or increase in zoning, not necessarily zoning to fit the project that was presented in 2019. We would revisit that. So we're anxious to be a part of the process. Um, we were invited here tonight. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have, but we're here to listen to and, and provide the feedback that you need from us. Thank you. Thank you. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, 
I was actually going to suggest that we do the floor area uh, exception first, because I think that might be pretty good. Okay. I, I did want to let you know that uh, Commissioner Esty reached out. He sent a, a note to both the chair and I saying um, that he had reviewed the staff report and he's done some analysis on his own that he shared with me in the past on the economics of the mall. Um, and he's in support in general of the direction requested by the mall and understands that economically he feels it's necessary. So just wanted to let you know those comments as we go into this. Well, I'll, I'll start on the floor area rate because for me, that's a no brainer. Um, uh, you know, I think it makes absolute sense because um, what's happening is that uh, people are providing less and less parking. You know, the state's requiring less and less. And um, I think for the mall to be successful because of, of what it is and what it's going to become, uh, they're going to need to have some parking. And um, I think not having parking parking garage included in the floor area ratio might even uh, make other projects that weren't going to do parking originally because of cost and size that they needed to have their building to do. So uh, I think it's a, a brilliant idea to take the parking garage out of the floor area rate. So, and that's what I would say. I, I agree. but. I, I think I could just make some general comments about the whole project. Because um, I was on the Planning Commission in 2019 when uh, when they came uh, before us originally and uh, and also was there in the City Council. And, and generally there was, it was, I wouldn't say it was hostile, but it was very critical uh, of, the, of the design at that point mainly because of um, economic issues of the city. In other words, it was, a, uh, it was a wash in terms of whether or not we would get any funds from this. The, in, the increase in public works uh, outweighed the increase in sales revenue. So basically the, the outcome from the Planning Commission as well as City Council was you got to put a hotel in there in order, in order to get some revenue. However, that was before we had this housing element uh, requirement and, and the requirement to increase our population. At that time, we, uh, we had a general plan that said keep, uh, keep the population of Capitola at 10,000 and we don't want a 25% increase. Well, now that that is mandated, that changes uh, at least my approach to Merlone Geyer 180 degrees. And I just want to say, Thank you for um, providing this uh, additional housing, and I am okay with the uh, uh, additional floor area ratio. I am also okay with the additional height requirements, and um, and feel that this, in fact, is is a great opportunity for, for us to get our housing home approved if we can get uh, we can get something going with Merlone Geyer. And um, and I and uh, yeah, I I'm not going to be one to stand in the way of, of their project. It was also I was it was also always a beautiful project. I mean, and they were very cooperative with community outreach and 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 you know uh, comments that we all brought forward bicycles, you name it, um, bicycle pathways and bus routing, and they were very receptive. So I'm sure that that good relationship will continue. And we should be as cooperative as we can be with the new reality. Um, one question. Um, what does this have to do, um, the interaction with these uh, suggestions and stuff, Katie, with what the city council is also doing with the outreach of, like, I think they're looking at it. Um, I don't know what the correct terminology is, but wasn't there uh, a lot of money that, that they have hired a consultant to work to make the project more advantageous to come forward. Is that in your lap with this? Is that override? Is this one of the items that are in that? Could you elaborate on that? Yes. Yeah, so um, 
you'll recall that uh, we've we've we kicked off a study of a land use study on how do different land different types of land use strategies that could be implemented to help with the redevelopment of the mall. That study is happening now. Uh, Cosmont is working on that. This very much aligns with their findings or what they're researching. I did uh, reach out to them at the end of last week to let them know uh, about the, well, I brought them up to date as soon as we got the letter back from HCD. And one of the ideas that they have been working on is looking at adjusting our heights um, is probably one of the more viable options that's really easy to do rather than they're looking at ideas of like specific plans and uh, other types of land use products but this is a um, this is an alignment with the study that they're doing but at this time they're not in a position to um, move forward with the uh, giving the results of that the study but this is definitely one of the tools that they will be suggesting I just want to make sure it was conflicting with where they're going and then at the same time are, are they going to be altering their focus of that study if this is something that has a lot of support at planning level? Would this be something that, um, be it that they hired a consultant, would this be like, if that was one of their big recommendations, would they be focused their energy on looking at other things that are going to be making it unique and advantageous for the applicant to, and other creative ways of working through this? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're continuing to put together the menu of options for us, so that will still be included in the study. Um, and just question, um, when we talk about the height the maximum, and some of those photos, I know they're of other buildings and stuff, um, would that be like um, roof level and then like some of the head decks on the top? So it, when we're talking about the the height of the, uh, of the building, would that be height and then it'd be accessible, or are we looking at just plate height, or how, how, what are we really looking at from that standpoint? So I think for the purposes of tonight, um, set to, to say if, if we were to figure out if 65, 75 seems adequate to get into the general plan, we would get into the specificity of that um, during the zoning code update. So if the general plan says 75 feet, I don't think we would get that specific to say and an extra five feet for um, mechanical equipment or any of that. We can fine tune that when we get to the planning commission for the zoning code update typically though it would be 75 feet to the roof and then you typically do have exceptions for mechanical um, and elevator shafts and other uh, necessary components of a building that aren't really used for a habitable space and if the planning commission wanted to allow roof decks that could also be included in that allowance beyond 75 feet but we wouldn't need to get that specific this evening thank you Welcome. Well, it sounds like we're going to talk about both of them together, mm -hmm. not just the floor area <laughs> show. So, um, you know, I'm I'm actually pretty comfortable with raising the height limit. Um, my hope is that when the mall does look at their design, they'll try and put the highest part of the project closest to the center of the site as they can. I know there's some restrictions on where it can go. Um, I think from, um, you know, listening to our community and uh, what happened in 2019, I think there would still be some resistance, for example, having 75 feet right on Capitola Avenue. But if it was, you know, the third story going up to 75 feet or there was commercial on the bottom that, know, created a more pedestrian kind of feel, uh, and I think those are, are you know, ways that, um, you know, we can work with the community and the developer to come up with something that's going to, you know, provide the needed housing and provide the economics that the mall developer is going to need to make this project work. And um, as Commissioner Wilkes said, you know, times have changed. Um, we certainly, um, when that mall was first built, you know, in the 80s, it was the cat's meow, and retail was a completely different game than it is now. And so I think we all have to be open-minded and uh, willing to, you know, see what creative ideas they can come up with 
uh, to make that property be blocking the mic. Sorry, to make that property uh, work for them as as well as the community. And just having that amount of housing on it's going to make it, a, you know, completely different site than it is now. So I think everyone's anxious to see something happen there. Um, I think people are more flexible now than they were before, and uh, you know, hopefully something can can come of all of this, where we have a project that financially works for the mall and design-wise works for the city. Question about the 75 feet. So this would be just for that site, or would we extend that like all along the 41st Street corridor? So the if, if you wanted to discuss it going beyond the mall site, we could. Tonight I was just asking specifically to the mall site, um, and that being everything within the Clare Street loop, uh, Capitola Road and 41st Avenue, so not including like Trader Joe's and Brown's Ranch, but really inside the interior mall site. It, it just occurred to me because I um, spent a lot of time in Redwood City and along El Camino Real. There's been a lot of development with these types of, you know, um, re, um, residential over retail, five, six stories. And um, it, 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 to me, it doesn't seem overbearing or... Well, it just seems to be this is the way the world's going. So to have just one just one site approved for that seems to me like, well, we're, we, we might as well just reestablish that, you know, create a zone, more, more of a whole zone as opposed to just one site where we would, uh, where we would allow that. Um, you know, like here is our high-density area. Obviously, we wouldn't spill over into the jewel box or anything, but but perhaps just, you know, on Capitola Road, just north of 41st Street and along 41st Street itself, perhaps even only on one side. But I think it would be uh, worthwhile to, you know, expand the thought beyond just this one in, in indication. The other thing I noticed was that, um, I forgot to mention earlier, was the open versus wrapped parking. Uh, obviously, the wrapped parking looks better, but... Isn't an open parking like the um, Target existing parking lot? Isn't that a, 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 an issue of like like safety and and um, just you know auto exhaust fumes? You know, getting in decent air and and getting um, you know a nice open space where there's lots of natural light. Maybe it you know reduces crime or there might be issues other than just aesthetics where you'd want open parking or unwrapped parking. You know, I, I don't have the answer to that, Peter. So that's something we can look at. We can ask questions about. But just uh, for clarification on your question regarding the zone within the housing element, we one of our um, to do, one of the items on our to do list, is to look at the boundary of the incentivized zone and possibly expand it down Forty First Avenue to include more of the um, retail and commercial area. So that that is one step, and we could talk about within that discussion, like how far this incentive, the additional height, where where that should carry. We can definitely have that conversation during the zoning code update. I don't think we want to commit to too much. Typically, you would never put a height limit in a general plan document, but because we're being asked to by the state in order to get certification, we're here today. <laughs> but um, so I think that is a great discussion. I think we should bring it up, though, when we get to that point that we're, we've got a zoning code in front of you with the modifications. No one heard from <laughs> as far as the, uh, the, the parking garages, is, I guess this is the question I have for, yeah, for um, Roland Guire, Guire, excuse me. <laughs> the, um, a lot of the in the presentation, there's a lot of subterranean parking. Is there is there any consideration for that? If there was an exception, the FAR exception, or is it going to be mainly wrapped and typically, elevated? Typically, subterranean parking is never included in the FAR. It's only above ground structures anyway. So we wouldn't look for that to be included anyway. So it wouldn't really be part of the exception. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that if if we if we can count. We have an FAR cap. 
we don't have to count the parking structures, we get to build more housing. Yeah. I mean, that, that's what it comes down to. <laughs> so by not having to include the and, uh, and it's actually changes from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Some jurisdictions you don't count parking structure in the in the FAR. Others others you do. Um, and so it's just a as we're looking to build more housing, if we don't have to, and in order to achieve what we're going, what we want to do here, it's all surface parking today, and none of it's included in the FAR. As we have to take that parking that's not included in the FAR and go vertical with it, we don't want to be penalized against building more housing. That's really the what's behind driving this. But subterranean parking, typically, we wouldn't do subterranean parking here. It just doesn't, unless we had to push a level down, one level down, maybe for a, a residential building, we typically wouldn't build subterranean parking. The question on the park and the openness that retail parking likes to be open so people feel safe and it's bright and they're not there that long. Apartments or residential buildings, they like the security. So it's a, it's a controlled environment and they're parking their car there for overnight or for longer periods of time. So they like the security. So they're less like, and, and you can handle ventilation with, you know, mechanical ventilations, but some amount of, some amount of uh, ventilation is nice. It's all about how you address the exterior. You know, you, you try to aesthetically, address the exterior of an exposed structure, which you can do, and you can do it nicely, uh, which, we've, which we try to do, too. And I would expect that if it is exposed, that we would have to, you know, do something with the facade, what we would expect. Does that answer your question, though? Yes, okay. and one more, actually, before you <laughs> go sit down. The, um, with, I remember back in 2019, there was a lot of concern about how tall the buildings were as they were up against the sidewalk and the street. Is that, I'm, with the increase of, um, with the exception for the parking and the maximum height, is is that going to be taken into account even with all these different changes? I don't remember the way the code was written. I thought there was already a step back required in height from the street. I didn't think we could actually push the buildings to the street. In fact, so I think our proposed project actually did try to step back the buildings from the street, or at least yeah. for at Capitola, we were getting closer. Yeah. We were Pretty far away, but but we would you know, we would not object you know if there was some kind of a step back you know some some cities will actually do where you end up with three or four stories on the street and then you draw like a forty five degree line back you know to get to, we're just looking for it to have seventy five feet within the project where the housing gets built and we would tend to push it towards the middle as well um, if we the most we can but we would expect some kind of a setback requirement from the street but we wouldn't be opposed to that okay thank you. For me, I think the mall is one of the most important sites in Capitola, and I think it's one that uh, the community uh, would very much like to see developed. And um, I think the community is willing to make uh, a lot of exceptions and concessions to have that site developed. So uh, for me, I would stick right now with the 75 height limit for the mall project, because um, you know I don't I don't think we want to create a situation where we get a big community uprising because we're going to do 75 feet everywhere and then the mall suffers from that. So for me, I I would limit it right now to that one site, and then in the future, once we have that, look at expanding it to other places. I agree. Yeah, I would agree with that too. Um, it kind of falls back to a question that I know, Katie, you guys were working on doing um, some rendering drawings of a potential project and what it might look like at different sites. So this might be something that maybe we might want to look at if that was going to be a discussion. With the, maybe that would be added on to to see what that would also look like if we picked a site at seventy five feet down forty first in the future. If that was going to be looked at. I think that would be some interesting study. At the mall, when we talk about stepping it back, I think it's a little bit different because there's so much space. But on a smaller, confined lot, it'd probably look a lot different. So maybe if that was connected in the future, that'd be great. Like having these aspects being contextually applied to each project is really helpful. So coming with, you know, having the context of your past application and, and then the changes coming with the code understanding where it's going to go really helps um, shape the project from our perspective and I think the community's input. Does anybody have anything else? No? Okay. Well, that, that's extremely helpful. So um, thank you for being here.
Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, so with that, um, I can, shall we go back to the policy and role discussion? I'll try to keep that really brief. It's quarter of seven. And then I think if we try to be back on, and there'll be a really in-depth discussion on Arkansas that's included in there. And then maybe if our goal is to be back, I'm looking at quarter of seven, try to be back on zoning code topics within 15 to 20 minutes. Does that sound reasonable? So I'll keep, I'll keep my presentation really short because I know you've looked through the presentation ahead of time. So, um, so we discussed what our work session is about. Our recommended action tonight is to provide feedback on discussion items, direct staff to prepare ordinance amendments. I have a homework assignment for you for our next work session. <laughs> You had asked some, uh, I think it was actually Commissioner Esty asked for examples of what is good and bad massing. And I would love for those to come from the planning commissioners and I'll put them into a slide deck and we can, you can, you don't have to identify if it's good or bad. I'll pull up the picture and we can discuss it because I, I don't want that to just come from me or from staff. It seems more appropriate to all, it, since it's a work session, I'm pretty, um, I'd love to see your examples of good and bad. And they don't have to be in Capitola, so, but, you know. Um, uh, so the background, we've, um, really quick, the zoning code update, we went through a process. I think it, from start to finish, was about six years by the time we got it um, certified by the Coastal Commission in 2021. We did updates in late 2022, and that was certified by Coastal Commission earlier of 2023. Um, we're now into our sixth cycle housing element, and we just discussed that portion, so moving on. So the first topic tonight was just, let's take a step back and really look at the big picture of planning and what we do here. Um, the, what's the purpose and effect of the zoning code, the relationship between the general plan, the local coastal program, and the zoning ordinance. So um, the zoning code, which is the rules of the road that we follow every day in these meetings, the purpose of that is to implement the general plan, which is our long range planning document. It's our blueprint for the future of Capitola and also implement the local coastal program land use plan, which is the long range planning document tied to the coastal act and our land use program and to protect the public health, safety, and welfare. Um, so the general plan element, or the general plan within it, there's eight elements. One is the land use element. And within the land use element, we designate what can be done in different parts of the city regarding residential, commercial, industrial, open space, public facilities, mixed use. And getting more specific within those zones, it um, or those areas, it guides development regulations um, for each of those land uses and our overall land use policy. This next slide lists the, um, the goals uh, in our housing element. I'm gonna try to move this. There we go. Um, there are, I won't read this slide to you, but I've put in bold some of the key um, terms that are repeated throughout the general plan, the land use, the LCP, and within our zoning code. And you're going to see the sense of place, the historic and cultural resources, um, sustainability, um, transportation alternatives, the special character of our residential neighborhoods, um, new residential and making sure it respects scale, density, and character the village as the heart of Capitola, um, high quality and distinctive design, uh, the transformation of the Capitola Mall. Um, so those are some of the first nine goals within our... Um, again, high quality development along 41st Avenue, active and inviting, um, thinking about thriving destinations and Bay Avenue, um, the utilization of City Hall and the parking lots is a benefit to the community. Uh, our public facilities that enhance the quality of life. Quality of life is something that comes up th 
throughout our general plan and our zoning code. Um, and again, high quality public parks, recreational programs, high quality of life. So just there's. Um, and when the general plan was rewritten and adopted in 2013, there was a, a committee that I don't, I, um, Susan, I'm guessing you might have been participated in that. Peter, Jerry, did either, Courtney? But there was, there was a group, I want to say, was it 22 citizens that? Mm -hmm. Noble was involved, yeah. So it was a several year project. Um, it really, there was a lot of public outreach to the community, lots of community engagement. And so that, that document and those words are something that it, it was a big undertaking um, uh, over many years by the city. Within the, our LCP, our Coastal, Coastal Program and the long range planning document, that's really about how we bring in our, the kind of the guidance within our general plan, but this, our, our land use plan is much, it's actually older than the general plan, and it's really tied to coastal access and programs. But when you go into that document, it is on our website under our long range planning, there's a lot of those words about like the village being the heart and historic preservation and keeping access to our, our coastline and uh, what a special place Capitola is and should be preserved. So those are a lot of the same terms. And then as you get into our zoning code, under the purpose statements of the zoning code, again, I won't read these off to you, but you know, quality of life, charm, um, range of housing choices, and coastal access, preservation, balance your transportation. So again, just reiterating, there, there are just uh, themes throughout for Capitola that um, is kind of our, our guidance documents for implementation. So that's the overview of how those three items work together. And then zoning, of course, gets much more specific with all the rules to tie back to those purpose statements and goals. Uh, the second topic was the administrative responsibility and staff's role in the application and review process. And so within um, the zoning code, it is... Uh, well, actually, if you go back to like the state government code, it's very specific that the city council, planning commission, and community development director, we function as the planning agency for the city of Capitola, which is required under state code um, that we have a, a planning agency. And then the, the next page, I'm going to show you the table, which shows the review and uh, decision-making authority. So this is um, from table 17.108, and um, it just gives you different, on the left-hand side, different types of applications that come in front of the Planning Commission. I'm going to go to sign permits and design permits as examples, and the Community Development Director that makes up of um, myself um, and, our, and Brian and Sean, the planners, um, we provide the recommendations on sign permits and design permits for, as an example, the Planning Commission is the review board who makes a decision on those um, applications. And then City Council ultimately is the appeal board if, if a decision needs to go there. Um, and our, we are tasked with under those examples for a design permit that staff makes a recommendation to the Planning Commission. So we go through the zoning code, we look at what, what is in the zoning code and um, what is our, whether or not a project complies, and then that's what we bring to the Planning Commission in terms of making that recommendation. And Planning Commission makes the final decision. The third topic is administrative responsibility, design review process, and the committee makeup. So for the purpose of design review, um, the current process, which we changed in the 2021 update, was um, prior we had an architectural and site review process. The new process was put in place to kind of streamline the process because of the timing it took between the two um, meetings to get to a planning commission and just streamline it with more oversight on larger projects for multifamily and commercial. So the current process is that city staff and city contracted design professionals provide preliminary recommendations to the applicant on the design permit, uh, 
prior to a planning commission review. And then um, through the review process, the staff and the contracted design professionals, we work with the applicants to produce the best possible project design consistent with the city policies and regulations prior to the hearing by planning commission. We do not take action, we make recommendations. And then once it gets to planning commission, the planning commission takes action on all applications. Um, the participants, um, for the majority of the applications that you see of single family, that's made up of city staff involving um, planning, public works, and the building department. Um, we also at times contract landscape architects, architects, and architectural historians um, for those larger for significant or sensitive projects, which I can um, require that we integrate others because they're sensitive or significant. But a city contracted architect is required for a design review process for all new proposed multifamily and non-residential construction projects. So you often see with our multifamily that we, we always, we hire RM design and they give a breakdown as well as on um, commercial projects that require a design permit. So with that, I've got the three topics there, and we can maybe start with topic number one, if there's any questions or any clarification that anyone wants to hit upon for topic one. I have just two general questions before we uh, get going. Um, when you say uh, like a commercial project, you said it goes to RM does the review, um, and they're contracted obviously by the, the city, and then the applicant pays those fees. Yes. Okay. And they're selected uh, through a process, um, like RM selected by the city. I mean, who was it? An RFP that went out. And yeah, we we actually put out an RFQ or request for qualifications. And they were the, um, we had a couple applicants, some backed out, and they were, uh, we utilized our um, through that process. For the and, and just so I know, just context wise, how long have they been? Uh, are they just ongoing? It, yeah, you have to renew, but they've been ongoing for um, since we started the new process. Okay, right. And then one other question How does that, when the city's looking at doing a strategic plan, what, how is that going to overlay on some of these, I mean, not exactly in zoning code, but with the strategic plan, how does that affect each one, any of these, or how, do, you, do you know how that, envision how that's going to work? So for the strategic plan, um, I think that that will affect, it'll have an impact when we redo some of these documents, um, but at this point, they would have no effect on, it would have no effect on this because it's more of a um, kind of the, the city operations and a strategic plan of how like decision making is made within the city. So if, I, I'm really not sure how to answer that yet, to be honest, because it's being presented to city council next week of exactly what it is. But if, if at the end of the day, I can give you one example of a strategic plan that I participated in at, at another city. Um, the city came up with, within their strategic plan for levers that every application should be measured against. So one was like small town, history, um, Maybe affordable housing was in there, and I can't quite remember all four. But anytime we, when we would write staff reports, we would actually put those levers into the staff report and how a project would or would not align with kind of the levers of the city. So that, that's one way it's been implemented in the past. But um, at this point, I'm not exactly sure how uh, the strategic plan, if it's going to be tied more towards um, how the city makes decisions around the budget or land use programs or everything. So I'm, I'm just. I just thought that was like an important part, like as we start to go through this, is this strategic plan starts to, and it looks like it's pretty fast tracked. And so if it's going to set like a new vision or a new outline for the city come November, you know, I was just trying to see how that was going to, I was confused on it and the interaction between that to all these different. 
things that we'll be talking about and you know, potential changes and stuff like that. So. I think if you bring it closer. The plan won't change the general plan or the local coastal plan or the zoning ordinance. Uh, those will all still be as they are now. Uh, it seems like the strategic plan might say that one of our goals would be to, you know, update the general plan or change certain things. But the plan, it, the plan itself won't actually implement any of those and and I think you know having been involved in it before not only in Capitola but in other cities like you know changing the general plan is a long long process so um, maybe it'll set out some you know guidelines in there but it within itself doesn't change those documents which um, I think we all sort of forget, even I forget, how much state law sort of regulates um, how zoning and general plans work. Thank you. So my comment on the three documents um, involves subjectivity versus objectivity, right? So this state has come down and as we go through the housing element and whatnot and saying, well, you, you need to have objective criteria. And so when we just have statements like small town field and coastal village charm, we may have a sense of what that is, but we somehow really need to create objective re requirements. And, and I think we have to a certain extent in the zoning code with you know setbacks and roof lines and we've you know we've gone in and, and tried to put objective requirements in there. Um, but I do feel that um, we, we, we need to be vigilant about that and, and try uh, not to let aesthetics and personal opinions um, creep in, <laughs> creep into these decisions too much, you know, and, oh, I don't, I don't think that's, you know, the European feel of the village or I don't like Spanish tile roofs or, you know, Whatever, whatever it is. I mean, there's. You can use the term "small town feel" and "coastal village charm" as as um, a loophole to to have all kinds of requests, right? So, I think in general, um, my concern or my desire is to continue to work on objective criteria and and, and minimize the subjective criteria. So that's. On that point, I I know that when we um, when when you want some the you know an applicant or you know in future development to have certain attributes, we can incentivize you know. For example, I'm trying to <laughs> I'm trying to articulate this. Um, in past applications, there's been issues with flat roofs. Flat roofs in town, in the village. Um, and there's nothing that, I, that I've that i seen that we could, if, if, if the city wanted um, pitched roofs, say, or some type of gable roof, we, having those types of um, standards in the code would be helpful. You know, saying that if, you know, you're incentivizing um, a pitched roof by measuring the height differently, saying, you know, from a, from the mid span of the rafter, and I've seen that in other municipal code, where if they wanted a gable roof, you could say, okay, it's a thirty foot height limit from mid span if it's a gate if it's a, you know, certain pitch, and that. Can we have that twenty five feet and for a flat roof, and then if you want. Yeah, a we gable, do that. We, we do seven. that in the village. We have the incentive where you can have a higher height if you do, a, a, you know, a roof rather than doing a flat roof. I think that's all in the village design guidelines. I don't think it uh, applies to like the R1 zoning district in those areas. But I yeah, it, it doesn't apply right across the street here, but it does apply just within the mixed use village, not mixed use neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, just stuff like that. I, I feel like that would be how to kind of clarify the objective standard, <laughs> making it making it pretty direct as to what we want. And if you want to, if you want to propose something else. That's fine, but you have 
you know, the curated standards describe it in a different way as, you know, as something that it's not necessarily not allowed, but it's not preferred kind of thing. Is that, I mean, you, yeah, I'll let you, I'll let you finish. <laughs> I'm oh, no, I, guess right? I don't, I guess I don't understand it because I think, I don't know if we're agreeing or disagreeing because things like, well, you, like flat roofs, you could say, well, that's not desirable because you could you know, maybe have a daylight plane yeah. requirement that says, you know, the the houses on 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 Capitola Road here are just two big blocks, and and you know, if you're on Riverview and you look, you suddenly you have no sunshine in the morning, right. and so you could have daylight plane requirements. Mm -hmm. Uh, in there, and I and we do have some. So, so the the I, you know I think the notion of small town feel and coastal village charm you can you can just continue to look at the kinds of requirements we already do have and say well all right it meets all of those and if we want to be go further and say you know maybe we don't you know maybe we don't like Spanish tile roofs or some crazy thing we should actually put that in the code and. Um, and again, quantify it. So, I love Spanish tile roofs, but. <laughs> <laughs> so, one one comment I will make. You know, um, I I've been involved in planning for a lot of years, and I do think that in in some ways, particularly in a document like a general plan, which stays around, you know, for ten, fifteen, sometimes twenty years. Uh, it's nice to have some language in there that's not absolutely defined because um, times change and things change. Um, you know, we've seen a huge change in Capitola Village over the last 10, 15 years, and not because the city's really done anything differently, but uh, the impact of people coming from Silicon Valley here, more people, more population. And so um, uh, I know some of those um, terms are vague, uh, but I think it, it gives the community some flexibility to make some discussion and, and different opinions as they go. Um, I mean, I'll be honest, probably 20 years ago, I wouldn't have voted for a project that I voted for at the last planning commission meeting because at that time, the community was, you know, pretty hard and fast with the direction they wanted to go in. Um, so I think, I think people's opinions change, and not everything can be black or white and measured. You have a design review process for that reason. You can't have everything written down and say, you know, if the building's this height, if it's this wide, if it has... 14 windows and they're, you know, this, then it's automatically approved. It really, it's, it's, not a, it's not as black and white as an awful lot of people would want it to be, but being sort of gray allows it to evolve over time uh, as well. I guess I don't have an objection, and I agree that the general plan should be general and have general guidelines, but like this statement about the small town community is in zoning code that's you know what we're supposed to be following and and, and i just think that the, the opportunity for i don't know you know the fashion police to <laughs> jump in is it's just too tempting and so we should try to resist that okay um thank you for those comments on, on that and I think there is a balance between objective standards and guidelines and all of that. So I think uh, we'll keep that in mind in thinking about the different parts within the general plan. 41st Avenue and what we just had the discussion on the mall site is very different from uh, the discussion of future heights in Depot Hill or in, so it, it, I think kind of outlining where those envelopes is important and what can be done inside them. But we'll move on to topic number two, administrative responsibility staff's role in the application and review process. Pretty clear? Okay. Um, and topic three, administrative responsibility, the design review process and committee makeup. 
So is this where we're going to talk about Arkansas? Arkansas. Arkansas <laughs> review. Yes. We all call it Arkansas still. It's like we, we, Development and Design Review Committee. <laughs> well, I, I would like to see, uh, see, I know that the city abandoned the old uh, Arkansas committee that was in place before. And there were, uh, the reasons for that had a lot to do with, it was difficult to get an architect who would, vol or a building designer, um, to donate their time to, you know, because paying paid $75 for the meeting was not really, you know, paying them for their time. So it was difficult to get people, it was difficult to get a landscape architect, it became, you know, cumbersome, like Katie mentioned, you know, they would cancel meetings and then the applicant couldn't go to the Arkansas committee, so then they couldn't get to the planning commission and, you know, months would go on. So um, it got changed to where um, basically that committee was abolished and uh, what we do now is that we hire a firm to look at the Arkansas aspects of multi-use, multi-family and bigger, larger commercial projects. And um, for the single family homeowner, they now don't really have the opportunity to get all of that feedback very early on in the process. And we all know it's best for people to get that kind of feedback early because it's easy to change your plans in the very beginning or, you know, sometimes people give you ideas that you hadn't thought of. I mean, it seemed to work for both applicants and, um, um, you know, the committee. And by the time something got to the planning commission, they'd really worked out an awful lot of the issues that were going on. So I don't. I don't know how how we go back, but I would like to see something that does take place, you know, early on and maybe has some sort of professional designer or, you know, architect there be part of that group. So, uh, you know, there's there's early feedback uh, on the on the design and how it's going to work. So that's my comment. I think uh, one thing I, I should clarify about this, the process that's in place right now is we first we get the application and then we tend to, we've got 30 days to say whether or not it's complete and the applicant will get feedback on just what's missing from your application so that they can resubmit. And that, that goes around to public works, uh, building and planning. So the incomplete letter goes out, and then once we have a complete application, it goes to Arkansas, in which planning, building, and public works are in a meeting with the applicant. It's a, they can be in person or on Zoom, and we sit down, we go through their application, and if they need to tweak the stormwater plan, or if we notice they have a second story deck that needs something, some changes, that's when we go through that, is that that Arkansas meeting um, so we have, I don't, I just want to point out that um, in the last, I would say since about October, we've done things a little bit differently and I'm hoping you're seeing that in the staff report in that we've been sitting down as a team um, before the Arkansas meeting and going through every design criteria within our code and identifying if we have any concerns and bringing those up, that was kind of the old, what the architect used to, that was their task within that meeting and bringing them up hopefully early enough so that, you know, with the idea of those suggestions being implemented or, or at least discussed before planning commission hearings. So that's relatively um, before, so it's more a little more formal within our department, but um, just so you know where we're at today, because things have, we have changed a little bit due to comments um, that we've heard from the Planning Commission over their last six months about the design reviews. So I just wanted to, that, that's the process of, there is one meeting with the applicants and all of staff, but no architect. I'm not sure I, I see the value of, the, of having an architect. Um, they hire an architect, usually, to create plans. So now all of a sudden you need a committee to approve your house? I'm thinking mostly about R1. 
So I can understand where like a multi multifamily unit or a commercial building uh, where we where we might want that input. Someone who understands the general plan and some of our goals, but when it comes to R1, the individual homes, I'm not sure the value of a second architect's opinion, as long as we have competent staff that can go through the code and say, here are all the requirements. You meet those requirements, you only have one more hurdle to go through, and that's the Planning Commission. Um, so I'll just say from a personal experience, um, I guess about 11 years ago, um, our project that we took through, we had the planning um, architectural review board. I thought it was extremely beneficial. Um, there are some challenges about our Pacific lot, and I found it very valuable. I think in that time it was Derek. I think it was Derek. Derek or I think it was Derek, and I think he or Frank. But. I think it was Derek. And there are some challenges that we had some, you know, as an applicant um, and had an architect on how we kind of thought. And it was valuable because we shared. I, mean, I remember doing some sketches at that back table about uh, another way of trying to achieve what we wanted to as an applicant and another point of view from an architect. And so I thought it was extremely beneficial. Um, and so I, I, I thought the process was great. Um, the people, I know a couple other people that went through it and it was, it was, a, it was a very positive. Um, but I have heard other stories, you know, um, that it, it delayed their project and stuff. So I think to figure out a way to streamline that, but at the same time, to ensure that um, that process happens, I think, as a planning commissioner, to know and to be able to read that report back of the review and what went on, and that it was like a working session um, was very valuable. Um, and I think it would be valuable, um, again, um, with that at the same time, I, I just think it's so key for an applicant before they get too far down into a structural engineer, and then it comes at our level, and we're talking, let's just say it's a window. It can be, it might just be a window to us as making a decision, but it can be a structural modification that could cost a lot of money from a structural standpoint, from a structural engineering, engineering something. Um, and so try to work through those things early, and um, at that level, I, I thought it would be a huge benefit to have it come back. So I, I'd like to pull the string on that a little bit, because... It sounds like you and I had different experiences as we went through this process. Yeah. So when you went through it and you had the Derek or whoever it was, mm -hmm. the issues that you were talking about were, oh, I don't know, how do I get this driveway to fit here or how do I meet the permeability or can you suggest some materials for this or this because I don't know, I didn't know about this requirement. What do you suggest? I can see that being very helpful as opposed to, um, you know, again, just some aesthetic requirement that says, you know, you should have, you know, uh, ship lap siding instead of, you know, shingles or something. And you say, well, okay, well, if that's what the community wants, I'll put in ship lap instead of think shingles. And, you know, and all of a sudden the planning commission says the opposite, you know, you know, it's it, it, two different experiences. And if it's, if it was a, if it was a dynamic, um, give and take where you were actually learning and getting understanding on how to meet requirements, I can see how that would be very helpful. And if that, that, that was your experience. That's exactly what my experience was um, on that. It was a working session and we worked through some challenges. And I think a lot of lots around here, you know, are unique and they have challenges and be able to work those through. And you know, we had one like on Riverview that came up and, you know, with the lot line, how could the, you know, uh, the, the driveway and turning radiuses and stuff, and they come to us at that level and, you know, how, you know, what is the turning radius for a car and that lot's tight? I mean, those are all things I think maybe another architect's perspective other than, um, I don't want to say as a mediator, but to drive, shed light to another professional that might be, you know, my architect was with me at that time, but to share another point of view on something to try to work through some things. So I, I just think it's a, it's a community benefit you know, that, uh, for an applicant to go through it. Um, I, I'd be sensitive to, you know, if that delayed their project for any, you know, reason. We all know carrying costs are extremely expensive for an applicant. But how can that be streamlined and to ensure that that process is fast? Um, 
but in the long run that it was beneficial for them to go through that. I think you kind of good. Thank you. hit the nail on the head. If it's just fast or efficient, I want to say consistent, where they get one set of comments from all the parties. They have one, you know, resolution. Everything is consistent all the way through planning commission. It, you know, this, it, you have the staff report that it comes to all of these different conclusions, making the recommendation for approval, I think is really helpful for the applicant. And, you know, all of those different design um, issues have, you know, are addressed there. And then there's a proposed resolution and the applicant can either adhere to those resolutions or think of something, another argument to bring for some type of variance or whatever. <laughs> but um, I just think get, making it as efficient as possible for them is, I think, the overreaching theme moving through um, their application. So you, you mentioned that in sort of like October, uh, you started this new process. Um, and um, from, from your perspective, uh, does it seem to be working well? I mean, I think so. I think um, we're working through more of the design issues up front with the applicant. Um, I'm actually going to lean on Sean a little bit on this one because you, you've been implementing this. We've been having our meetings earlier. And what are your applicants? I, I think it's been, from my perspective, when I get to a staff report review, I know the project well. I know what feedback has been given to the applicant. I know whether or not the changes have been implemented after the development and design review. And I, I think it's been helpful because you're seeing our recommendations in the staff report too. So we're trying to be a little more transparent on what we're asking or from the applicant and also tied into the report why. So what, what are those design standards that we're, the reason why we're requesting additional information? So any comments? I guess I'm, I'm wondering um, if there's sort of a hybrid model to this because um, having seen the Architectural and Site Committee over a number of years, there have been good years and there have been bad years mm -hmm. because, um, um, you know, it, it's like a, a planning commission. There are different people on it at different times. And um, uh, I do have some sensitivity for uh, Commissioner Wilkes' comment because there was a period when there was one architect on, on the committee who I, I think was more interested in having people design things the way he thought they should be designed rather than, um, you know, it, it being helpful to the applicant to try and solve the problem. So I'm wondering if it's possible to have, like, the committee that you have that you're working on, but if a project comes in um, where there's difficulty figuring out how to fit the structure on the lot there's you know there's definite design problems and as staff because it does happen you look at them and you go oh this is this is just never going to get approved it's never going to work it's you know these people have good intentions but it's it's not going to happen uh, if it's we could have something where you have the flexibility of bringing in uh, you know a design professional or an architect or something to help on on those single family homes early in the process. Um, and sometimes you get people who say, well, I'm just not going to listen to staff. I just want to go to the planning commission because I don't think staff knows what they're talking about. And, you know, the reality is they normally do know what they're talking about and know what will be approved or, or not approved in the community. And um, so maybe something in between. I don't know. I would like to err on the side of bringing it back, maybe listen to the experiences that weren't the positive um, ones that we had before and not leave it so subjective that then what project 
does go and then doesn't go and did that one should have went and um you know I mean so I thought you know maybe we modify the way it seems like there's you know comments about how it was ran before and that was before you know so maybe how do we bring it back now and don't call it the same title you know and but um that there is a new process um that's brought in so that there's a little bit more involvement and clearing of um perceptions and ideas at a lower level so that it's organized when it comes into planning with some feedback that we could see a report that was cohesive with other input Yeah, you know, we could bring back, we'll, we'll bring back options for a future discussion because all of this needs to go in the form of a zoning code update if we're, if we're going to modify it. So I think we've, we've definitely heard the different perspectives and we'll bring back some options and um, within the update. Okay. Um, okay, it's now almost 7.30. Is there a time that you want to go to tonight I just want to be want to eight o'clock stop want to we'll, we'll re let's reconnect at eight o'clock and see where we're at <laughs> okay um a fun one upper floor decks is that right yeah upper floor deck so this is one of our most recent updates and when we were doing the cleanup from the 2021 this was something new that was added to the code I think one item that we definitely need to talk about is um, the privacy screen under D. But just quickly, upper floor decks in excess of 150 square feet is included in the floor area ratio. We would like confirmation the way it's worded in our code under the floor area exception. It doesn't say if it's um, per deck can be up to 150 feet or 150 feet, or is it the is it all of the decks? So if there are three decks and they add up to, um, each deck is less than 150 feet individually, but they add up to 400 square feet, do we, what we've been doing is saying, we take 400 feet and we subtract the 150 exception and we say the rest counts towards your floor area ratio, but we, we wanna clean that up in the code and that's, we're looking for your perspective on that, if it should be 150 feet exception per deck or the, into all the decks combined. Um, Can you look at the all the decks combined? And it's only for second stories, not first. And that's the way it is. That's we. Um, that's how we've been administrating it, but we'd like to reword that. Yeah, I mean, I feel like that's the way that it's always been done, but I have I have an opinion. <laughs> There's a sure. um, the one the one thing that I having a sec, having living space exterior living space is really important, especially. Um, I feel like down towards the village area. There's a high uh, base. Um, uh, flood line like it's a, the base flood elevation you have to build above. So considering, you know, the base flood elevation could be between, you know, from a foot to three feet to six feet, depending on how close you are, you know, how low you're sitting. All of that exterior um, living space on the second story is now um, limited greatly. So I, I have, I really, I like that we've preserved the 150 square feet. It, it just makes it so... First, there's no, there's not a lot of exterior space, living space upstairs, um, and second, it, you're taking, if you have a deck that just happens to be, you know, 200, 250 square feet upstairs, or that you wanted to strategically put it into um, your second level, you're now taking space away from bedrooms, bathrooms, kitchen, living, dining, anything else, any of the other massing in the in the house. So I just. Um, I just wanted to state <laughs> that it's um, exterior living space is really important, and and 
making that as available as possible with consideration to your neighbors and, you know, sight lines and everything else is also important, but just not, not restricting people to the nth degree of um, trying to utilize that type of space. So um, this section here doesn't apply to the central village, does it? Um, does it not? I don't think I don't think it applies. There's there's separate guidelines for the village. Um, this section is talking about. <laughs> I mean, well, multi. Because the village is different than this section of Capitola. Right, but even know. across the street, there's, I mean, there's a high base flood elevation. I mean, just on Capitola Avenue in the MUN. Right. And, so it definitely applies right across the street. It, it's interesting. These standards are kind of out of place. It, they, they should probably be in our um, other, the other section. They're listed in our R1, but other zones do point to this section because right across the street, the mixed use neighborhood, I believe is subject to the second story decks in the R1 zone standard. Okay. Okay. So the FAR applies everywhere. Right. That's the difference. But in the, in the mixed use village, the FAR is a 2.0, so it wouldn't really have an mm -hmm. Across the street, the FAR is a 1.0, so it has an impact. Mm. So thank you. Sean just clarified that the, that first standard is also in our FAR, mm. and that's why it applies uh, throughout Capitola. It seems like it might make some sense to look at this because I do think there's a difference between the, you know, sort of R1 neighborhoods, you know, particularly the... Um, you know, smaller ones like Jewel Box or Riverview Terrace. Um, and, um, you know, maybe we need to get a little more neighborhood specific um, about um, uh, second floor deck regulations. Just considering the context of each, I, I don't disagree with how we have it stated. I just, in designing homes in the village or in the adjacent areas in the different Sections. Right. Well, the, vi the village is different, but it sounds like the adjacent areas to the village is not different. Yes. So what I'm hearing it is, is it's more tied to the size of the lot. Yeah. Right. For, so Cliffwood Heights, where you're going to have a larger FAR. It makes we, sense. We don't think it, like, this is fine how it is today, mm. but on these smaller lots where every square inch matters when you have a really small lot and therefore your FAR is lower or your floor area is lower, then it really makes a difference when, with this. So maybe something similar to our driveway standards on small lots, having some type of exception, or not driveway, sorry, garage standards on small lots, maybe having an exception for decks on very small lots. The flip side of that is they'll be closer to property lines and right. neighbors. I was going to yeah. say neighborhoods <laughs> like Riverview Terrace where they're really small, you know, then you get into a lot of impact and privacy issues. So that's why I go back to my point. I think maybe you need to look at it almost by neighborhood by neighborhood. Yeah. I mean, it is very contextual. I just, I just come up, in my imagination, I'm thinking of like, okay, well, we have to build above habitable space above the base flood elevation, and now that's, you know, second level pretty much, and now we can't have exterior space beyond 150 square feet, and it just makes it so limiting. Well, you can have it beyond 150 square feet. It's just that it counts into your floor area and, ratio. And then your like Katie said in the village, that number is higher. So it's not a cons. It, you don't have the consequences there that you have like across the street. Sure. Yeah. So, so. Uh, one suggestion there is, um, I think when we first were looking at drafting this, we were talking about like social neighborhoods and having more front, like uh, second story decks in the front of the home where it doesn't have such an impact on the neighbors, and maybe including another exception for front decks on the front of the home. Yeah. Where, because then you're not so worried about that. And that isn't there a downside of that? I mean, if we're worried about our small town coastal charm, 
uh, we're actually allowing larger and larger buildings, right? Because now we're not going to count deck space. And so we're getting, we're, we're allowing outside living, but we're creating massing problems. But how is that a massing problem? I don't, that's, that's kind of my, how, how is it created? If you're creating a, a larger house with additional exterior space, um, you, there's a, I mean, you, you're going to have to maximize every square inch of that, of that allowable FAR to really utilize your parcel in, in parcels this size. I mean, is that, I, I, I kind of want more description of how the massing is an issue. So, okay, so I guess if it's a zero-sum game. I agree with, I agree with Peter. If you're, if you're not going to count it in the floor area ratio, um, you know, and you've got a small lot, then you're going to end up with a bigger building on, on that lot. Um, uh, but I also agree with Katie. You know, maybe there are some, some ways that you can do that because, you know, the deck on the front of a structure, it's, it's going to be fairly open. Um, you know, that's not, that's not really adding to me to the massing of the structure. So um, how do you do it? I mean, and I think a while ago we were talking about how the, the um, decks on the front or the second level exterior space on the front of the homes adds to the um, interaction of the street and how, you know, that creates more of a, a small town feel and a charming sense of, you know, interaction of people on the street, people in the homes. And I, I if we could allow for an exception in that regard, I think that would be really productive all the way around. So. Um, there's there's a common uh, design that you see out there. We've got a 15 foot setback on the first story and then a 20 foot setback on the second story. We have a requirement that the second story deck also has to meet that 20 foot setback. Mm -hmm. One thing we could do to is allow the second story deck to be at the 15 feet where the first story begins, mm -hmm. and then just so people could take advantage of that five feet area kind of a social, hopefully sunny spot, and then maybe not count that five feet area on the front, you know, within that setback area towards your floor area ratio, just to give more opportunity for outdoor, but something along those lines. I think that would be really good for this entire city. And then it assists with the small town charm. <laughs> You're not like yeah, your neighbor is charming. All sides of this, all sides of this, <laughs> trying to be devil's advocate. I, I like the idea of the re, reducing it, you know, and so, I mean, it's not going to uh, be any more pronounced than the, the first story. I mean, it, it'll just be at that plate line or at that wall line. Mm -hmm. I just think that was. So, on a, a, a side note of that, I mean, you have a, a, sh, a slide in here saying that, that that second floor deck, if it's over living space, that's called a roof deck. And so that's not allowed? It's, no. So it's that, over a roof? Roof decks are okay. Roof decks are the way so I always... That's something we need to... It was just, um, we have a cleanup item in our zoning code cleanup list. Yeah. That we, we want to um, clarify that the rooftop is really the rooftop and, and couldn't be interpreted as... The way it's worded is funny in the code, so that's just a cleanup item. Okay, that's yep. a cleanup item. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't think there have been any issues with B may not face an interior side parcel line abutting a lot within a single family. So you can't orient your deck towards your neighbor. Correct? That one's fine. Uh, must comply the with privacy the privacy screen. What? Question about the privacy screen. So we just had this discussion at the last meeting, right? About the privacy screen and five foot versus six feet versus four feet, whatever. To me. So we already have a setback on this on the side yard, right? That's, that's more than just the, the normal five feet, whatever. So you've got a second story setback. Ten feet. So, mm -hmm. so to me, that that's already provides privacy, that setback. So you don't need privacy screen or opaque glass on top of that, in my opinion. I agree with you. <laughs> I, I agree. I agree, yeah. Right. But, um, 
For me, it's a, it's a case by case basis, just like windows in the side of the house. It's going to look into the neighbor's yard. Where are their windows? You're doing an infill kind of project, and how is it going to work? Um, I mean, I think there are cases where, you know, having a privacy screen like on this was just on the side of the deck because the deck was facing toward the street. Um, uh, you know, it makes some sense to, to have a privacy screen there. Um, yeah, you know, we, we, um, we could switch that from a shell to a may, and it, it, we can just reference that the Planning Commission may require a privacy screen. I think that's productive because then it gives um, the, the neighbors some recourse if they do have an issue with it. Would that be right? And what, one of my issues has always been, I don't think our decision should be based on the current neighbor uh, <laughs> because we're talking about trying to design structures that are going to fit in our community and work well as good neighbors for the next, you know, 50 years. And all of those neighbors are going to change. So some of our things like, you know, having a privacy screen could be because, you know, it's things are going to change. And... Um, so I, I, I'll get myself in trouble. I don't put too much credence in what one neighbor says right now. What we want to do is good planning for, for the future. And that's why, you know, I think it's important sometimes to have opaque windows in certain places so the property doesn't look <coughs> down completely in the backyard of the house next door that's already there is they can't change things, they're already there. Um, uh, even if the neighbor says, well, I don't really care what they do. Uh, it's not about what that neighbor cares about, it's what's good planning practice for the future. I agreed. I just like, just for example, the last application that we had come up with the big wall, I, I think that some advice, I think that designer had a bit of mis. Um, understanding of what the screen was because it was a complete you know over I don't think it was appropriate to have a wall there you know and, and to have a screen if she just were to put up you know either a vegetation screen or an opaque piece of opaque glass or something that but that have that actually be listed and, and really um, clear so it's not just like oh well now we have to put a wall on that side of our deck and it's just I think that would be poor planning because it's it seems to be such a misjudgment, <coughs> a misplaced. Um, right. I don't feature. think it needs to be a wall. I right. think right. it needs to be some sort of privacy screen. Of course, I, I just think that that should be very clear of what a privacy screen is, so these future designers don't misinterpret that and start building walls on the. We did have words to that effect. You, you know, I had to cut it out because uh, just to fit in here, but it, it does say example <laughs> opaque screen we could we can elaborate on that to say vegetative screen opaque screen i mean just, is it portable is it portable yeah i mean sure. i'm just saying like if it's vegetation i mean that could be a planter and then go ahead Sean. i was just going to clarify that the code does express that it needs to be permanent and i yeah i i think that would infer that it yeah, and the same for clarifying, and we're going to give out recommendations of what it is that things should be clear. If it's on the second story and it's a planter of vegetation, you know, how is that really secured? You know what I mean? You know, <laughs> and, and, you know I'd say, oh, it's a planter, and you stick it out there and say, well, it's full of dirt, it doesn't move, but it's, you know what I mean? So yeah. I think yeah. cleaning that up a little bit, if that's where we go. I'll be in a minority here and just say that I don't that opaque windows and 5Z screens are really necessary. I think setbacks are probably adequate. If you want privacy, you can grow a hedge in your yard or close your drapes. Um, and you, there's exceptions. Obviously, you don't want to be looming over some neighbor's yard and you, you knock your beer off your railing and it knocks your neighbor on the head or something. But, um, but for the most part, um, 
uh, I think we're I think we're too aggressive in terms of protecting people's privacies. Just my opinion. Um, I <laughs> yeah. What I'm hearing is provide more examples. Uh, let's look at it. Let's remove that this is a requirement, but that it's a may. The Planning Commission may require a privacy screen and giving examples of what that is. And we're not going to add a specific height. Is there any discussion on that? It's just it's a maybe and the Planning Commission can decide case by case basis. And it should really be integrated into the architecture so that if we are requiring it, it stays. Right, I think it gets back to um, when we say privacy screen not allowed, but obviously code, you have to have a railing at 42 inches. And so when, you know, I think what we did at the last meeting was we just left at 42 inches as, and that was going to be the privacy part of it um, because that was the intent of the code at 42 inches and it wasn't brought up you know, to a five or six foot tall. Is that correct? That's correct, yep. Yeah. And the way it's written now, it's a standard, so um, that will give us more flexibility to, if if you think there should should, should be at a, a, a certain height because the neighbors is at a certain height or something like that. That well, it says it begs the question. So the topic came up that the architect said, "Well, I don't know what's a what's a privacy screen? Is it five foot? Is it six foot? Is it four foot?" And then John did his best to try to come up with a number that would, would, he thought would work, and he. And we ended up not agreeing or not settled, settling on a standard. So I think that'll that'll come up again. And until we, you know, as long as we leave it vague, it, the architects are going to be continually frustrated. We could say may require up to a six foot screen. And this would be an item that then would be addressed at uh, the review stage that if the state status quo or if there's our site review, these are things that would be worked through and addressed um, at that level, right? Yes. Yep. Like on the last one, I mean, I think that one just kind of ran away, but I think those are the things I was using, for example, that could be worked through so they get here that, it's a win-win for everybody at the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I didn't hear, I think, the under C, the setbacks work, except we'll make that change to the front to align with the 15 feet. Um, we just talked about the privacy screen. E is for second-story deck or balcony, which may not project further than six feet from the exterior building wall to which it is attached. Um, that seems to have been working. We got some comments from the last applicant that it's a really small deck. But um, the last step, so her 45 square foot deck, right? Is that what she was complaining? I think that was a pretty good example of the issue that we were just talking about. Of She was taking, actually, no, I, I'm stopping. I think she misunderstood, <laughs> honestly, because she, she wasn't taking advantage of her full credit. Does that make, is that right? I'm not sure, but I, I don't think she had, to, did she have a, was there a deck on the front of the home? I don't, so, so she wasn't taking, yeah, she didn't utilize the whole 150 square feet, correct, Sean? <laughs> it was a little difficult to make a, a larger deck in that area work, especially on the side, and there wasn't, really a, a space for it on the back because of how they had their, their great hall kitchen area in the back. So there wasn't really anywhere to attach it in the rear. By putting it towards the side, if they wanted to make it bigger, they were somewhat limited by the fact that they had a 10 foot side setback. Mm -hmm. And by extending it further back towards the rear of the property would have made it predominantly facing the side yard, meaning we wouldn't have allowed it for that reason. Mm -hmm. So they were effectively by trying to get a deck there limited to more or less what they proposed. So why is it six feet? Where did that requirement come from? What, what problem are we solving? Why can't it just be to the setback, whatever it is? I, I think it was 
um, well, one thing is originally, originally there was no floor area, right? It wasn't tied to floor area, the second story decks until we amended them. So we were trying to kind of resolve a couple issues at the same time. So, but the six feet was really to make sure that they're not um, a place that it's not like a big party deck or anything like that, that too much, you know, it was, we were limiting it in size so that the impacts of that deck on the neighbors isn't, if you're going to have an outdoor event happening, it happens on the ground floor where you're not looking over because over onto your neighbor's lots. I think the idea was to, by the six feet, was really to limit how much happens on a second story deck. But if you have a, uh, in terms of social, you have a second story setback, so you've got an additional five feet plus the six feet, right? If, if, if your second story is set back from your first story, whatever that is, 10 feet, I don't know what the number is. So that's now a 16 foot deck, 16 foot deck. So you're speaking on the back of the home? I'm, I'm just looking at this requirement. It says, okay, they, ex, they have six feet from the external. I'm assuming that's the ground floor. So it overhangs six feet beyond the ground floor. Now you have, if that's a second story deck, your second story is recessed, set back, an additional X number of feet. I don't know what the number is, 10 feet. So now you do have a party deck. It's 10 feet because that's a setback plus the six foot overhang. So off the back of the home, if you're on a 40 foot wide lot, you're required to have two 10 foot setbacks from the side, right? So you could have an area of your home that's 20 feet long on the second story, but the deck comes out six feet. Mm -hmm. So that might, so it doesn't, you don't have to bump in your house. If you, if you were to inset the second story, you're still limited to a six foot why um from the second like story depth from the second story wall oh yeah so from the exterior wall on the second story you're only allowed to go out six feet i don't have a problem with party decks <laughs> <laughs> so but if if theoretically then if you're you can only protrude six feet but then you could also build into the house over the first story another 20 feet if you have the FAR allowance. I, um, yeah. Right, so you could have a 26 foot deep deck if you really put the effort into it. If it were over, yeah, because it says from the exterior building wall to which it is attached. Mm -hmm. Right. So it seems to me that I, I you could have some big sliding doors that open up all in of your house out to the six foot deck if you want to that's convenient but, but you can't but the it is measured from like the wall to which it's attached so you couldn't i'm sorry i was picturing in uh, courtney's scenario of the second story being a lot smaller in that you could include like your deck could include the area over the first story as well as a six foot deck and i don't think that's what this says I think on the second story, your deck would be it's six feet from the wall of which it's um, oh. gotcha. of of the exterior building to which it's attached. So if 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 on your second story it's a lot smaller and you can walk out onto your rooftop, you could only walk out onto six feet of that rooftop. I think that should be to the six six feet from the first floor. So you could have a larger deck. Due to the setback of the second story. I, I think we need to have some drawings. Drawings, yeah. Some examples and things to look at rather than trying to visualize things that we, we, we can't do. Yeah. We can't just <laughs> yeah. I'll sound so like we're Italian. It's, it's there to make believe accordion. <laughs> but what I'm hearing, it sounds like folks would be okay with having a larger deck as long as it's on top of your house or no we're not sure okay we'll we'll come back with drawings and we'll talk about it um six feet let's see roof decks are prohibited in the r1 zoning district i haven't heard any discussion to change from that 
and you can't just have a freestanding deck that's above 30 inches on your property. Okay. Can you, um, I'm sorry, just come back. Um, what about uh, a green roof? A green roof? You know, um, on the oh. second. I'll have to bring that back to you. I think we have some standards in place for green roofs and required vegetation. Yeah. I think it connects in there with, um, what, is that F, right? Yeah. The roof does? Yeah. We've had green roofs before. So we've, we've had a few green roofs approved. Um, Okay, next topic was the vision for the village massing, aesthetics, height, and roof decks. And here, I just wanted to bring it back to the, um, our general plan and the goal of ensure a high quality and distinctive design environment in the village. Um, we talk about new development design should really enhance the unique character of the village, um, maintain our scenic resources, Looking at our parking and transportation alternatives, talks about the hotel, and then, but specifically, we had an action item about village design guidelines and to update the village design guidelines to reflect current conditions and encourage new development that enhances the unique qualities of the village. Um, so we did this, and before we had a little handout for the village design guidelines that were very, they were outdated, um, and we actually took these guidelines and put them more as objective standards into our zoning code. So on this slide, I show a couple, of, I've got three slides that show some of these new standards. The first for the building orientation, that the primary building entrances need to be um, oriented towards the front sidewalk. Second is the location of parking should be behind um, storefronts, the trans required transparency. Um, maximum blank walls of 10 feet are allowed. And then also um, differentiating the storefront design every 25 feet is a requirement. Um, this is where that height exception comes into place. So we um, allow additional height within the village for gabled and hip roofs as long as it has a minimum 512 roof pitch um, and a maximum plate height of 26 feet. And we show how that works. Um, yeah, and then we say that uh, exterior doors and decks above the 26 foot height are prohibited so that that's really, we've got a, a roof deck prohibition in the, um, in the village. And those are the standards. So I think, I'm not sure if I hit upon exactly where, um, I think Commissioner Jensen asked for this item, and if I'm not sure if I hit it quite right, but I just wanted to show that we do have some design standards from the village, and I'm not sure if the concern goes beyond the village, and I'll leave it to you. Yeah, I was just looking at, uh, you know, we hear comments about, like, the village and aesthetics and everything, so I was just trying to understand, you know, um, when we see a project come forward, you know, it, was, it matches the neighbors, and then... So that's two, and then it goes to four. And so as that starts to change, that massing starts to build. And like you lay out, if I understood that correctly, you know, every 25 feet, there has to be a change. But if it's per project, you know, it just can be continuously growing. And, and so I was, that's what I was concerned about, and I wanted to understand the massing and aesthetics as projects, is, if they're continuing built the same way, pretty soon that the whole aesthetics and the massing would really change throughout the village and it gets to I think the comment earlier you know what is the quaintness or exact terminology of what the village is so I think you know I, I I think it'd be important to establish what the the vision of the village is without locking things down but you know when we look at projects one by one um, they do start to build when you put them all together as a total so that's where I was that was my comment when I'd like to open up for some discussion and see what other commissioners thought about. Doesn't this, doesn't this figure address that, the storefront widths? We well, can't have the same thing over and over and over again? Well, that, for that applicant, right? 
No, this would be three different buildings, right? So if you have the if you have the one, say the one in the middle was was the one that was pre existing, then the ones on either side would have to be not the same. They would have to be you know, this one's gabled and that one's lower. Yeah, and that, that's why I brought I brought it for discussion because I wanted to be educated about the overall vision and massing of how the village is going to go. Yeah, my comment on that is I think village should extend all the way up Capitola Road. Same requirements. But I'm not going to get boundaries All the way changed. to Bay Avenue? Yeah. I mean, to me, those are the same buildings, the same, it's all part of, to me, that's pretty much part of the village as you're, as you're coming in. I don't expect I'm going to get boundaries changed, so just a comment. And I think the uh, the rift deck thing was just trying to get a better understanding of the project that we looked at um, across the street. Just you know, when does um, third floor roof decks come into play? And just just going through that exercise was all I was looking for. Village is interesting and it's difficult because it's it's such a mixture and you know when you when you go back and um, you look at like the local coastal plan that's really old there's a whole area down in the village that's designated for residential only and um, my recollection is that came about when the philosophy was sort of to have a village you had to have residential you had to have you know a mix of commercial uses and that's what gave it its charm having people who actually live there and we've seen that completely change with uh, the vacation rental business because now you know very few of those residential units in the residential designated area are occupied by residents anymore and um, you know there's always the discussion about you know how many more bars can can be down in the village you know what kind of uses could be there and I don't you know I don't have a real good answer for it but I do think somehow um, you know the city has to sort of maintain a mix down there if it's going to be a village and not just become a food court. Um, I had a question about the vacation rental issue that Susan's touching on. Um, why the county has, the county's code for vacation rentals are distributed county, I mean, it, through different jurisdictions, but they're based on a percentage of, um, of the frequency of how, which per block, basically, is my understanding. And um, based on a certain number per jurisdiction, I think like Live Oak, um, the Pleasure Point area has like 200 and something. I can't, I can't remember the number exactly. And if there's anything left, then they, they take the next person off the wait list and it's distributed evenly over the region so it's not just all concentrated in one area and then we have a problem where it's you know generally vacant because it's just transient people coming in and out um, um what was the reasoning of of the vacation rental ordinance being that you have a grandfathered license just by virtue of living in the village in that one zone and then it not being allowed anywhere else besides that zone um, I mean, the reasoning behind it is a little lost on me because it seems that it, it creates this issue where there's just nobody living in the village and it kind of takes away the overall charm and, you know, quality. I think the prevention is so that that doesn't leak into our single family neighborhoods or our depot hill because um, um, having, having lived in a tourist tourism industry oriented places my entire career and seeing in my my last city hitting a tipping point of almost 50 percent of the homes becoming sent 
second homes. Yeah. It really, uh, that impact of second homes on a neighborhood and that neighborhood small town feel. Um, but I, I can see both perspectives, but I, I think that was the, uh, the reason for concentrating at one area. And I think Susan probably knows the answer better than I and was involved in that. So there was, there was a huge outcry from most of the residential neighborhoods that they did not want vacation rentals in those neighborhoods. Uh, partly because they felt it takes away from being a neighborhood because you never know who's there coming or going. And um, so as um, almost more of a compromise, everyone agreed, well, we will have them down in the central village area. Um, probably the mistake that was made was not limiting the number of the residences in the central village that could be converted to vacation rentals. Uh, but then, um, you know, I will have to say on the city side, they like the vacation rentals because they like the TOT tax and the revenue. So, you know, you're always sort of battling that. But uh, for me personally, I think it's worked really well in Capitola to keep them out of, you know, the adjacent residential neighborhoods. Um, you know, a lot of the neighborhoods are pretty small lots and, you know, um, I've rented vacation rentals a number of times myself, and I know when I go there with my family and, you know, kids and extended family, we're on vacation and we're there to party and have fun. And so it's a little different um, vibe than you get um, in a normal residential neighborhood. But the, the city, the, the residents came out really strongly against having them in the neighborhoods. I think you see a huge influx of ADUs added real quick. Oh, yeah. I mean, because that would be the vacation <laughs> they're, rent. They're deed restricted. You can't, I mean, they well, can't use I'm them. I'm saying if you expanded the um, vacation rental. Oh, no, I, yeah. I think my, my thought in saying that is that it, it seems to distribute the effect over a larger area. So it's not so, you know, that's such a stark contrast between here and just across the street kind of thing. It just, it, it seems like it would, if there was one or two vacation rentals on every block, it wouldn't seem as noticeable as a large exodus of tourists every winter, you know, and, and it being empty, you know, in the village area. But it was just a, just a question of, of what the reasoning was. Why aren't we more similar to other um, municipal codes in that regard? And personally, I think you're going to find even more of a backlash against vacation rentals. I mean, it's even starting on a lot of people objecting to second home buyers because uh, as housing gets tighter and tighter, um, you're going to see more and more restrictions. And I think we're you're seeing it in places like in the Tahoe area um, where they're really cutting back on the number of vacation rentals that that are being allowed. So I think Capitola has a good balance with what it has right now, allowing them in the village, but not in other areas. So going back to my, my comment on this one, Katie, um, I, just, I, I didn't hear a lot of discussion regarding the, the vision of massing or aesthetics um, or heights in the villages. So is that just everybody's fine with where we are today? And, Has there ever been any movement on this whole hotel situation? <laughs> no, you know, um, we've definitely uh, I've been very active in reaching out to the hotel and trying to talk them into coming back in and let's let's study, like, let's look at a circulation study um, and talk about your parking garage that was proposed. Some of the items that came up during the conceptual review, but at this time, we are not a priority for the hotel, so... Um, a parking lot is what we have. So, yeah. Yeah, and one of the big things that's changed is there was a lot of talk at one point about having a parking structure. 
And now, you know, because the parking structure was going to allow the hotel to develop because then they, they could use the parking and the parking, excess parking and the parking structure. So, um, you know, it seems like once that went away, the viability of for the hotel developer sort of evaporated as well. I thought they still had claim on 50 spots in the... They, they do lot, have a um, lot, lot, I think. We have kind of an over when the lower Pat Cove was developed into a parking lot. Um, there's about 50 parking spaces that are ready. I think there's about 60 actually that are associated just for a hotel in the village um, with their redevelopment. So that that does exist. Um, I think, you know, right now I'm working on the the city hall study and right now that we're doing all the fact finding and there have been surveys with staff and um, hoping to bring that to our city council in either March or April to kind of give it an idea of like what is city hall today and then um, what are our projections for the future um, projections of population within uh, the city overall and then asking the city council do you want us to take this to the next step of looking at options for the future of city hall and how that would play out but we're really doing our fact finding now we're looking at projections now but i'm hoping march or april and that's when if, if the city council tells us well now that we know what it is and that we, we will probably need to grow in the future um then to tell our um it's called group four architecture that's working on it to tell the consultant All right let's take this to the next step and come up with a couple different scenarios that could happen at city hall but we're that we would need budgeting for and we have committed to let's do our fact finding first before getting into the scenario build out of city hall so that back to susan's point if we go into scenarios i could see that conversation coming back up of right because you see the lower parking lots only temporary yeah. <laughs> it's going to be a park. It's going to be a park. <laughs> Open it up to the creek. Yep. Okay. We doing okay? 810. Keep on going. Okay. Water efficient landscape design and installation. Um, so right now within our zoning code, we reference the water districts, both Santa Cruz water as well as um, SoCal Creek water district. Whenever an applicant comes in with an application, they also have to comply with the standards. I thought I could just go to the district site, show you a paragraph of what their requirements are for landscaping. Their landscaping standards are much more strict or much more in depth than what we require in our application. So, um, sorry. So I first I should go, I, I thought I skipped a slide there. So the applicability, whenever we have a new single family home, a landscape plan is required. Also, if the existing landscape is disturbed or a new landscape is added as part of the application, then we also, within a single, this is specific to single families, we require a landscape plan. That landscape plan is required within the hatched areas that you see on the image. So always in the front yard, and then if you're on a corner lot, it's you have to landscape the exterior side um, we don't require the landscaping plan for the rear yard or the interior side yard um, and then how that ties in is they also have to comply with the district water district standards and um, and then what is required in a landscape plan it's pretty much uh, like the site boundary and the placement of buildings as is with in the application but then showing the existing landscaping and trees that will be preserved. Um, any new landscaping that's proposed as part of the development, the irrigation plan, if they're proposing one, the grading, and then I can always ask for more things if we think you're not quite in compliance with the code, just to, to before we bring it to planning commission to ensure that they're in compliance. So those are the code requirements. And with that, any discussion on landscape plan? Discussion. Oh. <laughs> so right off the bat, it says under landscape 1772040, it says this purpose is to enhance the aesthetic appearance. 
and I don't think those words should be in there. I think this landscape plan should not be a plan but a checklist. Um, so there are requirements that you know the Public Works has, obviously the so-called Creek Water District has. Um, there, are, there are practical reasons where you would have, you know, you want permeable surfaces so that we retain our groundwater. You want to have trees that don't block intersections so you have sight lines. You don't have roots that get into sewer lines or disturb foundations of your neighbors. And there's, there's a, there could, you could create a checklist of things that, um, that say, here's, here's what your landscape must meet. But to go in and say, like, I'm sorry I brought this up in front of the, the last applicant, but I, I, uh, I felt for the guy who was using every last penny to create his design, and he said, well, wait, what? I've got to have a landscape plan? I wasn't even thinking about my landscape yet. I don't know. I'll put in something that meets code. I don't know. Do I have, well, you know, all right, I guess I'll hire a landscape architect. And I just said, oh, man, he shouldn't have to have gone through that. And so like I said, well, how would you avoid that? Well, if there was a checklist, it says, okay, here's, here's, here's what you have to do. You know, you hear the plants, you can't, you can plant these, you can't plant those. And rather than having to either hire a landscape architect or think that, oh, well, gosh, I, I'm going to try to become my own landscape architect and memorize and learn what all these existing plants are, look up their, uh, you know, their Latin names and, you know, like, how am I going to, how am I going to do this? All I guess I got to hire an expert. Whereas if it was a checklist, say, follow it, you know, there you go. You, you meet, you meet these requirements. Are you required to hire a landscape architect or can you do your own plan? You can do your own plan. We updated that. Um, based Welcome. on your, your <laughs> input previously. And it's in our, application as the landscape plan is required but it, you don't have to hire a landscape architect for it you can submit right and so but, but i think that that was the misunderstanding of of calling it a plan is like calling it that's a document you got to create you have to create it out of your imagination you got as opposed to here are the set of requirements you must meet which is a lot easier that's just another okay here's another list of municipal code things i have to meet Right? Now you've got to meet my setback, I have to meet my height requirement, I have to do this. Okay, and here are the landscape requirements. I've got to meet this, 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 this. Done. And then you don't need the plan, and you can worry about that. You know. are, are you suggesting that we add the list that we have here? These are the, requir these are the requirements. To, we could have a handout with a checklist for the landscape requirements. Say, okay, here is the landscape plan. Fill this out. Check, 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 check. Okay, I won't do this. I'll do this here. I think that's what she's, this is pretty much the checklist, one through nine. Um, I, and, and honestly, like, the most complicated part about this, I think, because I've done and seen many landscape <laughs> plans, I feel like there's really not a, a, compl a, a complex list here except for maybe the irrigation plan, and that needs to be completed just to... Um, provide that you're not going to be hosing your property down, I'm, I'm assuming, like you're not going to overuse water, and that would be part of the Wello document? Yes, and, and the requirements for an irrigation plan are much stricter when they go through the Soquel Creek Water District of exactly like what the tie-ins and everything is for, you know. Um, yeah. I, I so just, it, it's just saying you have to have your irrigation plan, but once you go through the... So Cal Creek Water, it's much more specific. What, so what is on here that isn't already on the drawing? You already have the... This is what we require. What? what the so it's the existing landscaping. It's right, so I'm looking at those. site boundaries. That's already on the drawing. You know, so you don't need a separate plan for that. I, I think maybe what would, to, to aid in what you're um, giving, giving a checklist like this and then possibly giving a pretty literal example of what other people have submitted because they're really not complicated it's I mean it's like a bubble of showing like bird of paradise and that you don't have to really call out their Latin name um I, I don't think you should have to pick out your plants well but but at the same time you're being fair to your to your neighbors too because if maybe you, you decided just to put ground cover all over it, it's just I don't know it doesn't really, wrong with that 
No, I What's mean, wrong with weeds? It, it's natural. We're, but you're advocating for the neighborhoods too. I understand that you don't want people to do a landscape plan. You don't like landscape plans. But for me, I think the way it's set up now, where you only have to do it for your front yard, for most cases, on certainly on a corner lot, you have to do the side yard. That you can do your own landscape plan, which is not complicated at all to do, um, is is a reasonable requirement to have. And I think it, um, uh, you know, I also think it eliminates um, confusion at the end when what needs to be done for the whole building site to be signed off and finaled. Um, and certainly they can go back in later and they can move plants around and they can change them, they can add more, they can delete more, but um, I, I'm, I'm comfortable with requiring, you know, this kind of landscape plan. And there is that flexibility built into that that I can amend, I can accept amendments to the landscape plan, and we do that frequently. Well, I guess so. my concern is I was wondering then how, how did this applicant get confused so if it's just a simple thing like okay i've got here's my landscape plan let me get a eight half by eleven sheet of paper i'm going to plant these plants here boom 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 there it is they seem to be confused about a lot of issues i am confused about a lot of issues and that's why i'm so thankful not this you i meant the applicant. <laughs> applicant they seem to be a little strangely advised sometimes. i think um if i remember that they were going to try to uh, uh keep their existing landscape intact during the project wasn't it and so I think that's where maybe more of the concern was that that's probably not really going to be. There's no possible way. To yeah, do that's that. not probably not going to happen. <laughs> and I also like um, when you guys do your final sign off without a plan in place to at least know like conceptually where things were going to go other than just a check off list saying shrubs or, you know, certain type of shrubs. I mean, the layout um, and what, you know, kind of. As you walk around the house and you look at are the windows in the right spot and the doors in the right spot kind of a thing and then you look at the landscape isn't it a tool that you guys use as staff too to, uh, a plan to be easier than just a check off sheet yeah we, we like to see a plan and exactly what where the trees are supposed to be and where the plants are supposed to be we'll be like i said we can be flexible but really just showing we, we do review that when it comes in to make sure it's a substantial landscape plan and not just mulch in the front yard so yeah, i think it's also good for well i think what courtney was saying with the neighbors you know as they look at what the house is going to look like to also have an understanding too like you know what's the overall project going to look like when it is complete even though we just got we we have <laughs> we have had applicants um that have you know, harvested their plants, put them to the side during construction and reutilized their plants. That that happens. Um, but really when we did the we when we did the update to the code, this first section we really did rework in terms of just if you're really going to disturb the whole site, we need to see what you're going to bring back. And that that applicant could have shown us that they were going to replant the plants they had in the front yard. But once we started looking at what's there, and we noticed just this huge stump and just different things that were happening, it was like, well, we need to see a landscape plan because there's no way they're going to do this construct. The, it's pretty much a tear down, rebuild with a few walls staying that that whole front yard was going to have to be re-landscaped. So. Coordinate that back to like what Soquel Water requires, which is pretty excessive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that really is going to, help them I think understand what as they design their house too, you know, what the landscaping or what they're gonna be able to do and you know, from a landscaping plan planning that at the same time they're working on their house. Mm -hmm. So I, I think what I'm getting out of this is I think we as staff can put together a guidance document on landscaping and what's expected. We've been working on guidance documents, like I said, for new businesses and that's just something we can uh, offer at our front counter and online. I think that would be helpful. Again, I, I, I just, I, I'm just trying to put myself in the shoes of these applicants who, who are coming in for the first time and they don't know this process and 
you know, you're getting hit with all these requirements and here's another expense, there's another expense. And, um, yeah, the most, the best we can do to help them out, you know, if the, the landscaping plan can be a, a, just a straightforward, easy thing. I think we should, we should try to help them. I think the comments will probably come back, um, a lot more when they look at landscaping after you get done going to Soquel Creek because the requirements that they put in place and what they have to do probably comes back to landscape and then it looks like from a city requirement standpoint when it's really the impact from Soquel is pretty excessive. I can't, I can't dictate what Soquel Creek does. but No, but I think that maybe, and just connecting the, the comments around, if we talked to an applicant, we did a survey and we said, what's your number one complaint and they came back around landscaping it might be more that the requirements around the willow and what's required from the water company that then reflects onto the city required landscape plan yeah. i would I, I would say that our requirements are probably the most sim simple out of most cities that I've heard. even the county is i mean it's a multifaceted document that just goes on forever. I, I, I think this is so simplified that. Um, well, that's a good reference. <laughs> so the next layer of landscaping is stormwater. And within stormwater, this is state regulated. It's within our code. We have a, a section of code 13.16. This is actually reviewed by our public works department. And it's really the philosophy of when rain comes onto your property, you really need to slow it down, try to contain it on your property, and then um, minimal amount of water should go into the storm drains. So, and also just prevention, pollution prevention. So we have, it's by code that we, and we have to meet certain standards within our region. It's broken up by region. Um, and essentially, there are design standards and design measures that are adopted by the city, as well as low, income, low impact development design standards. And we're talking about those, it's um, like water collection um, and just different ways in which an applicant can keep, contain their water on their property and get it back into the groundwater rather than getting it out into the storm drain. When an application comes in, one of the first steps we take is we walk down, we walk the application down the hall to Public Works. They review our, our the stormwater application, which talks about how much of new and replaced impervious areas on the lot, and then we, from those numbers, depending on how much area, it, it either becomes a tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four project. Um, tier one projects you see all the time in our single family homes and that's really where we just ask them to do low impact improvements to keep the storm water on, you know, gutters, drainage, um, but trying to contain the storm water on site. Um, tier three, we've seen um, in, on our larger projects, so um, an example of a tier three project would be the Olive Garden out at the mall and really having, they've got a lot of parking area, a building, and really had to create these large retention basins for all their stormwater so that they're keeping it on site and like reutilizing the water um, as efficiently as possible. So when you get into a tier three, it's pretty expensive. Um, there's on our website under public works, there's a post construction requirement page if you want to go deeper into this. But um, it basically, this, this also just breaks down within the different tiers, what are our requirements. Um, so really just uh, the more, the higher the tier goes, the more requirements you're going to have to meet. And when you get into a high, when you're in a tier two, tier three, tier four project, those are shipped out to an engineering company that looks at um, the, their plans and looks at flows and makes sure it complies with our state regulations. So something that we do, we have got a consultant that looks at that and um, it can, it's a pretty major component to all subdivision applications now because we look at all subdivisions as a whole. And um, so this is just another layer of what we require of applicants, but we really have, we, we don't really have any flexibility in this whatsoever because it's a state regulation. 
Do we have any flexibility in terms of looking at the subdivision as a whole? Because I mean, like, give the, given the Howard's project up the street, that was a, you know, they split that giant parcel into three. And um, that was a cr crazy drainage system that they had to implement. Yeah. And the, the expense for two single family homes and an apartment building just seemed pretty cumbersome for, I mean, those two brothers to, to circumvent. So I, I know, I think that they had to try to do a tier three, if my memory serves me, but it was, and it took up a huge part of their land. If there's, I know that we don't have a ton of flexibility, but in terms of our consideration of um, future subdivisions, especially with all the SB9, I mean, how does that apply? I, not that you have to go into too much depth. Yeah, um, I, as far as I know, I don't know of exceptions to SB9 regarding stormwater, but this is, it is um, really expensive. It, it almost killed the Olive Garden project, to be honest. It was um, because of their site require because of the site. The other part of this is we always require this to come in and be compliant before it gets to planning commission. We did learn, I think with Olive Garden, at that point we were conditioning applications and they'd gone through this whole process and then they went to stormwater and then they realized how expensive it was going to be. And it was a nightmare that, um, so that, that is why we make the applicant, applicant go through this first. So, because it can really influence the design of a project, so. But the city has no recourse, basically. We're just doing what the state says. We do exactly what the state says. And we're the, um, the Santa Cruz region, I believe, has the strictest standards in the state, which. Okay. And I suggest for all of us, if you haven't gone and looked at it, the project that Courtney's referring to is the one that got built up here on Capitola Avenue with the apartments and the two residential. It's worth going up there and looking, particularly on the side, I think, where the two residential units are, how much of the site is taken up with stormwater retention areas on that site. It's it's worth checking out because it's extensive. It really impacts the front yard. It, yeah. The cost, just the engineering alone was close to like $70,000, I think. It was, it was a lot of money for just, just the implementation, construction, preparations. I mean, all of it. I, I just, I don't know how to change it on the state level or how, if that is really what the reasoning behind it was or is mm -hmm. on that higher level. I don't know. Anyway, thank you. It's sort that of like our new housing element. Right. <laughs> it's like, let's make everything cheaper, but we've got all these requirements, yeah. so there's no way to make it cheaper. But Thank you. So the topic nine is the massing, and I'd like to hold off on this one. I really... Um, I think Paul actually asked for this item, and I would love for photos of, or any, you can just take Google Earth pictures, whatever, or send me addresses, but I think it would be a fun exercise to go through some of what you think is good and bad massing, and we can talk about why. Um, and then just tying it back, you'll be looking at floor area ratio and heights to really control massing and setbacks, but that's those are the tools we have. Um, and some of our objective standards of like when a mass having steps in buildings and that type of thing. But um, the next topic is opaque windows on second stories. And right now, the only criteria we have is our design review criteria and privacy. Um, and it, we talk about the orientation and location of buildings, entrances, windows, doors, and decks, and other building features minimize privacy impacts on adjacent properties and provide adequate privacy for project um, occupants. So with that, who would like to start with opaque windows? Well, Peter. <laughs> Your comment about you have to design, for, not just for the existing neighbors, but all future neighbors. You never know when a neighbor is going to build a house that's going to be across a window. So. That means all second story windows should be opaque because you never know when the next neighbor is going to build a house that has a that has a, a sight line into your bathroom or whatever. Mm -hmm. I I think the notion of the opaque windows is is, is similar to the second story decks uh, and the privacy issue. Uh, 
um, I, I, there may be there may be there may be many instances in fact where you would need you'd need opaque windows but for the most part I don't think they should be required I mean this should, should be a rare exception I, I agree. I think if we were to um, do anything, if we were to make any suggestions, I think that our solution to the screening um, discussion with saying, uh, instead of using the words shall as the operative, I may be using may just to give some, to give, you know, the commission neighbors, the applicant recourse to make it a further discussion of privacy. No, I think one of the important components in it is the original design, you know, the beginning design of the new building that's going to be built. Because what we're talking about is, you know, an infill building going in. Um, so the neighbors next door, they're already there. Their windows are fixed. They're, they're there. So, um, you know, having one of the components that gets looked at in the original design uh, you know, when it comes into the city is how is it going to impact, uh, you know, to have a window that looks directly into a neighbor's window. Um, those things can easily be moved in the beginning of the, the design process. So I think it's something that's important for staff to look at when you're talking to an applicant and, um, you know, figuring out how you can design this building so it can go in and you don't need to have opaque windows. Uh, it seems like where they often come up is in bathroom windows because, you know, somebody wants to have them there. And for me, I don't, I don't have any difficulty with them going into bathroom windows. I think people usually sort of, you know, screen the bottom part of their windows in, in their bathroom anyway with some curtains or, or something like that. So I think it's all part of the design review process that, you know, in certain instances. I think um, where we've had some discussion about it has been with ADUs because they don't go through the same process. And so, and we also allow them to be closer to the setback lines. So suddenly we we're having ADUs that were being built with a second story, um, you know, three feet away from the backyard of the neighbor looking into it. And I think in those kinds of cases, you know, it's important to have, uh, you know, some, some privacy considerations and, you know, opaque windows seem to be an easy way to solve that problem if, um, you know, that's the case. So I don't think it's, uh, you know, opaque windows everywhere. And again, it seems that we need to have it a little more um, fine detailed about, are we talking about ADUs that are going to be a couple feet from the parking lot? Are we talking about a residential unit that's going to be 10 feet away? I mean, those are different scenarios. So I, I don't think it's a black and white issue. And I, yeah, to add on to that would be like the word may and what the overall design is. Um, and if that's done early in the project, you know, because right now, the, how's the process you guys handle when a project comes in to evaluate the opaque windows? Yeah, it's case by case. There's no requirement in the code except for the ADUs um, because those are administrative review. But it's case by case, so recent applications in which there's a two-story really close to a property line in which the other house is really close, or if it's in um, these tighter neighborhoods, we'll typically recommend that um, opaque windows. But we, you know, we can look at that a little bit differently and say in our staff report, like we mentioned to the applicant, that the planning commission may require opaque windows. Um, but if, you know, I'll just, I'll give the example of across the street where the other home was, uh, along Riverview is really close to 417, 419 Cap Ave. In that scenario, we, um, not along the stair, I think the staircases, we didn't require the opaque, but just where the bedrooms were like overlooking someone's backyard, um, requested opaque. So I feel like there's not a lot of 
combative applicants that, I mean, if you suggest something saying, you know, maybe this would be a good idea, they, they seem to, I mean, given the option, maybe they wouldn't make it opaque, but um, if it means their application's going to go through seamlessly, I don't feel like there's been too many applicants that have had a problem with it. I think we had two that we erased it. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, remove that as a contingency just last year. So I think we've discussed it so many, not a ton of times, but I just know two of them. I think they're the only two that came forward that is written in staff comments, and then we have the discussion, and then we remove it. And I'm trying to streamline the process. So, you know, I think one thing I, tr I'm, I try to work very closely to understand is the recommendation comes from staff and they're following guidelines and then it comes to a discussion here and then it's overturned and it's, it's not a negative comment to staff. They're doing a great job and trying to, you know, follow a certain process. And then we are not arbitrarily, we, maybe we haven't even gone out to the project to look at exactly, and, you know, um, the applicant says, I, I don't want it and then we're overruling. So it just, I'm just trying to, I think with my standpoint, I was trying to have a baseline of consistency across the board as a, as a starting point, and so that it's not an item discussing um, an opaque window on somebody's project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we really try to look at the neighbor's windows and really what's going on around it before we would go to the recommend. It wouldn't be just we think you should have opaque because they've got a backyard. <laughs> I know it's the really, one. Like, what was I'm thinking the, about what was the deal we had? The, the one in Escalona, where they, they had they wanted to have an ocean view, even and the neighbor who was even had a set. They weren't. They were on the one at Escalona, I think. Yeah, and 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 they, nevertheless, somehow they ended up with this opaque window that they felt that I thought you, was it in the kitchen. Was it? It was, it was in the kitchen, right? Kitchen or in their breakfast nook or something. Yeah, and so, and I don't think we should use like one exact, you know, to try to set, but I think. Those are just things I try to look at and we can streamline or understand if there's and maybe it seemed maybe something for you guys to bring back and say maybe there was something that we missed in what the staff's recommendation was behind that on why that was I think if I remember correctly, it's about they were gonna be looking down into the neighbor's front yard at that. I forget. Do you remember? Yeah, well, I, I, I thought I remember that was the neighbor two doors away was complaining. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I remember one opaque window with the code enforcement of they had installed like an illegal. I think that was on, on was Saxon. That, that was Saxon. That was one on Saxon. I think that was that one. But the other one was on um, Escalona. Um, but anyway, so so that's to your point, I guess, is that is is that we just need to make sure that we, we don't. We're not over enthusiastic about these things, but so there are cases when, you know, again, if you've got a two houses butting each other and there's a you know there's an opportunity to place a window here or five feet over, yeah, move it or or make opaque glass. I mean that that's pretty reasonable. But some some you know the Escalona example is like, well, how did we get into that recommendation? That's it's kind of over the top. So so again somehow uh, specifying exactly when op opaque windows are required or, or just have more of an agreement? Because this whole notion of saying, well, we may overturn it, boy, it's like now all of a sudden we're putting a lot of burden on staff to try to guess whether or not we're going to overturn this. Or I hate to put that on you. We do have it in the ADUs, and for me, that's an important one because that doesn't go to any administrative body to review. I mean, that's just uh, basically it's an over-the-counter permit if you, you know, meet certain requirements. So, you know, in that case, I think the instances of requiring opaque windows in certain situations, the wording should be in there that they're required. Um, and again, because they're closer to the property line and usually, you know, the ADUs being built in someone's backyard closer to, um, to the neighbor. Um, when it comes to, you know, single family residential projects that are going to come to the planning commission, um, then I think it's um, 
fine to change the language in there and go to may instead of shall. And then that way they can be evaluated on an individual basis, looking at, you know, what the circumstances is on that particular application. So how that, how that would work would be if it is, is now staff would say, well, here is, here is a topic that might be contentious. Uh, you may put in opaque windows or you may choose not to, but it may come up in the planning commission. Is that how you do so, that? So how it would be done, because we don't have a standard for, it's only for ADUs. So what, where it falls is under that privacy standard. So during our development and design review meeting, we would say to the applicant if, if their window was uh, at the three foot setback, but aligned with the next window next door at the three foot setbacks, so they're looking right into each other. It's like, well, we've got a concern with this window. Um, over, um, we, we have seen situations in which that the planning commission will require an opaque window. We do usually say if it's a bathroom that we think it should be opaque or at least covered halfway. Um, and, but we could take a different approach of just highlighting it as a concern within this standard and say to the applicant, we're going to bring this up in the report that there is another window six feet away and they, they line up. And then the planning commission during their meeting might require it to be opaque. That's not a, having an opaque window is not a big deal compared to having to move a window, like cost-wise, I'm thinking it, if, if that change occurs, that's pretty simple. And, but what, I'm, what I think I'm hearing from the planning commission is you'd prefer the flexibility of it and to kind of, you know, we'll warn them and then they can decide if they want to address the privacy concern or the planning commission may require it. I think across the board, providing that um, door for discussion for those types of issues, like the guy up on Depot Hill that the neighbor didn't want him to have his chimney so close to the property line, mm -hmm. you, and he was happy to omit the, he put the chimney on the interior side, I think it was, or something. He, had, he came up with a different solution. I just feel like having those types of points embedded in their uh, standards that will open the conversation, allow for deliberation, and then bring the points up that might be contentious as, you know, the application progresses kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That seems fair. Okay. So no real changes there, just the delivery. Okay. Um, we've made it much further than I thought we were going to make it tonight, so thank you. Well, so, Paul's, Paul's not here. No, just, oh, yeah, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Chatterbox. Peter's losing his voice. Peter's oh. losing his voice. <laughs> All right, so this one I think we captured, but I'm not 100% sure in our village discussion, but aesthetic guidelines regarding character of Capitola. I think a few people made comments about wanting to talk about aesthetics, and... I wasn't sure if it was just towards the village or if this is a separate discussion, but what it really comes down to is, um, you know, is, is just the, guide, the design guidelines and us looking at the design guidelines, looking at the surroundings, because a lot of the guidelines have to do with the surrounding neighborhood and um, how the design fits. I often think of within our neighborhoods, you're really looking at like the braille of the community. And if a building, like thinking about how the structure fits within the neighborhood and how it relates to a sidewalk and um, the overall height and the massing and the scale relative to the, you know, within the block are things that we really try to look at when we talk about aesthetics. I think aesthetics is a pretty general term. So I could see like, um, but really looking at like local vernacular and that type of so that's where that's headed. We have our design criteria, I want to say over about 20 different criteria. So it's really all encompassing in there. But um, that's what we really look at is like what's surrounding and how does it fit. So. I think it came, you know, it seems like every time a project comes in that maybe is it pushes the envelope, right? And then the first 
comments that the community makes is it doesn't aesthetically fit into the surrounding area. And so I know it's not something I think we can, this group or anybody's going to be able to um, come to agreement on what is aesthetic guidelines, but it seems like, like my example earlier, you know, it, it just and not just using the example across the street, you know, the the report comes back after it says, and the project fits in because the next door neighbor's house, you know, is designed about the same way. And then the next time that next door, the next house comes in, you know, uh, in last two houses, you know, um, have, and so that the aesthetics can change real fast, you know, as projects improve. So, um, I just wanted to bring up just because I hear so much, and that's like the buzzword, you know, the static character of the of the village and everything. And then, you know, what is that? I mean, I don't I don't know what that is, but I mean, um, it's just it's concerning as things can change, and or maybe and maybe they are, and that's good, and that's and it's a common theme. So, I think the aesthetic character of the village has to do with sort of the size and scale of the village, and. Um, you know, certainly architecturally, there's all sorts of different architectural styles down in the village in those works, but it's it has more to do with the massing and the size and the scale and the setbacks and um, you know how how the building fits in. So I think it's a it's a problem because it depends on the planning commissioners. We have a different set of planning commissioners. They're going to have a completely different set of ideas of what aesthetics mean. So if we can do something like, you know, specify the kinds of words that you all just said, and here's what aesthetics means, and not, again, style, I don't like modern, I don't like this, I don't like craftsman, I don't, you know, but that's what aesthetics, to me, that's what aesthetics is. But... And so that's very subjective, um, but the kind of words you're using are, are a little bit more objective, and so that that's more comforting, or that's more that's that's easier to deal with than saying, "Oh my gosh, I don't know what kind of planning commissioners I've got this year," but roll the dice. But I think that's the nature of cities and politics, and you know they they change continually. Um, I mean, I, yeah, I think that, um, uh, you know, as the community's opinions change, different people get elected, they appoint different people, um, you know, that's part of the evolving process. And just as there's groups that would like to, you know, write regulations where absolutely nothing can ever change, um, uh, you know, those people aren't successful in doing it that way, just as the people aren't successful in saying, oh, I'm worried it's going to change because I'm not here. Um, that's that's sort of the, the nature of planning and growth and evolution and how cities evolve and become what they are. Well, I, you know, uh, I look at the project that, I don't know the exact address, but, you know, the Pizza My Heart project, you know, the four different, one building, but four different. You know, I thought our group did a, a great job in giving some feedback. I thought that uh, applicant did a great job of coming back. Cause, uh, you know, at first, the first one looked like they were all kind of the same. I thought we were pretty clear with wanting definition between and it, mm -hmm. I know you go down there now you're like to me I'm like you know that was a huge improvement it f it fit in and it's a huge improvement and there's some changes but um but then again we changed the aesthetics because you, know, you go back and look at some of the old pictures right um it doesn't really look like that but we did and then you know with the new patio coverings or whatever you know Little man start covering that extends down in front of, you know, where is that the Mai Tai or mm -hmm. whatever, um, you know, it looks great. And so, um, but the that is sex changed. So well, I always think that was to a positive. So I think the difference is, is in that case, you, you just can't. You, you gave them, or we gave them, um, broader guidelines. It was like we want differentiated storefronts. We didn't go into details of. This is the material, or this is the size of the overhang, or I I prefer brackets instead of you know the kinds of things that 
that are also aesthetic requirements. And so I guess to your point, it kind of depends on the planning commissioners. Um, unfortunately, um, you guys are pretty good. <laughs> I, I think it's, but the, again, I just think it's really important to to have that open door for discussion. So depending on the, I mean, if we had a different set of planning commissioners, it would have been a completely different conversation. But I feel like having that, having the conversation is the important part. So then as the people cycle through in and out of the, you know, of the, um, the group, you can pull from, you know, well, they did this last year, they did this like 10 years ago. And I don't know, it seems like, yeah, I think the hardest thing is that I, I do think basically all property owners and all applicants need to be treated equally and fairly. And what you don't want to see happen is that they're um, just because of who somebody is or whatever that they get special treatment and special privilege. Uh, it really needs to be a system where everybody, um, you know, is treated uh, fairly, and you want to have enough rules that sort of ensure that they they are treated equally and fairly. But um, you know, uh, things change. I mean, I said the other night, you know, the a pro project that got built up here on Capitola Avenue, where there's the sort of modern apartment buildings. For me, they work in that particular location. They're completely different from everything that's in the neighborhood but they're well designed and, and it works. And some of it has to do with, you know, design and taste. And you're never you're never going to completely eliminate that when you talk about planning and design review. And I've never seen it eliminated in any community. The state seems to want to do that, right? right. They came in and said, let's let's have get rid of the subjective requirements because that's an opportunity to deny a project. So Make your planning codes objective, right? Isn't that isn't that our yeah. charter? So, and next you'll see communities go away. Well, <laughs> I think like, it just seems that it, it's a shame that you would that it depends on when it, you know you have a project. You'd you'd hope you'd go to staff and say, okay, uh, staff gives you all the requirements. I, I I met all the requirements. Is what I like, and then. And then you, and then you just, perhaps you could go in front of the planning commission. <laughs> you don't know what you're, you don't know what you're in for. Well, you just you, you don't want to be, you want to, you want your expectations set. You don't want to have, you don't want to be surprised after you've just spent a fortune on a on a on a drawing set. I think when um, I think I just want, or maybe somebody else brought this up, but I just wanted to have the conversation about that as a planning commission we talked about. The aesthetics, and we talked about the village, um, not to change anything, but just that we looked at things and things evolve. And you know, maybe every couple of years we just touch on the topic mm -hmm. of looking at, at, you know, how many more things have changed, and are we getting away from aesthetic guidelines? But going back to, you know, make sure everybody's treated fairly and everything, you know, um, and the same is extremely important. You know, and that there's not different treatment for different people. So. I think that's just where I was coming from to just open up so that as people use that, um, you know, the aesthetics of the village are changing and, you know, we don't like flat top roofs or we don't like, I think you were saying Spanish tile, Peter. Um, uh, uh, but I mean, those, yeah, but I mean, I think it's just key to talk about these things and make sure that we are all in sync that um, we don't think that it is changing to a, to a severe degree. Just wait till there's a hotel project. Oh my gosh! Well, here. <laughs> I hope I hope there's a hotel project. I think um, a lot of people do. The two places in which we could have aesthetic guidelines that are really prescriptive are Lawnway, because it Lawnway has a very def, defined architecture in it, and as well as the Venetian court. I think. Um, just to, as things change there, just to have uh, guidance because there are historic districts, they're protected because they're historic districts for flood purposes and being rebuilt. But that that's one area where like the materials really are, you know, just to have to have really clear guidelines on what you can and can't do in terms of windows, 
uh, stucco or th that's a place where it really swirls in it. It, it really <laughs> matters. But that's a historic district, though. That's different. that's a district, but that that is a place where aesthetic, like very uh, clear guidelines, would could go a lot a long way for anyone that owns a property there to know what they can do with their property in the future. Just to um, okay, one more. I think yeah. Okay, this is the last item. Okay of our zoning topics. Variances in California government code section. So this, um, when you read the government code section, which I have on this slide, it's almost verbatim in, it, it pretty much is verbatim within our variance section. So we are required by state law when we look at a variance that they can only be granted when there's, um, because of special circumstances applicable to the property, including size, shape, topography, and it goes on and on and on. You've heard those words, you've seen them in a million staff reports. That comes right out of state law. Also, when um, granting a variance, it shall not constitute a grant of special privilege inconsistent with the limitations upon other properties in the vicinity and zone in which the property is situated. So this is direct out of state law. We did add three other criteria to our variance standards um, to be a little bit more specific um, in, in ensuring that it, um, I think, complies with the Coastal Act or Coastal and then probably our general plan and zoning. But I'm not quite sure what the other two are, but we go a little more in depth, which we're allowed to do, but these standards have to be in our code by law, and that's why they're there. Um, and the other thing is the variance can never be used for a, a land use. So you could never say we're going to allow um, a Wendy's in a residential neighborhood just because everyone in that neighborhood really loves Wendy's and wants to drive through in their neighborhood. But we could never allow a variance for that because it's prohibited by code to allow a variance for a land use. And that just brings in predictability for someone when they buy a, a property and knowing what, what is allowed. And um, with that, I think, Susan, you requested this item, and I, I don't know if it was just so everyone's aware or if there was more to it that you wanted to discuss. Yeah, mainly I think it's for everyone to be aware. I mean, I think people want to grant variances because they like a project or they want someone to do it. And, you know, legally to grant the variance, it really does have to do with the lot itself. It's not that the neighbor next door got to do something or 14 houses in those two block areas got to do something or something that was done before. It's, it's um, yeah, I, I think we get a little lax with following what is the law because people say, oh, well, I want I like their design. They're such nice people. I want to let them, you know, do this. And... Um, I think in those situations we need to look at amending our zoning ordinance if you know we want to want to change how we do things but uh, we really do need to follow the state law when it comes to granting variances well, I mean we had we used to keep us online I know. Yeah. by golly when he was on here I'm just like why and he and he is right and you know it's been a while since the city's been sued but we'll be we'll be sued again over those kinds of things Okay, our broader topics, I think we can hit on a few of these because uh, the first one, I, want, I think, is more of an update from me on Zoom right. and oral communications. So uh, our city clerk uh, reached out to a lot of different cities, got information on who is and who is not using Zoom, and it's still the trend that most people have cut Zoom communication in terms of public comment out of, uh, we're not utilizing it because of all the Zoom bombing that was happening. Um, the thought here is that uh, Julia is reaching out to the same communities again, and this recently went to city council in January, um, and they wanted to see, come back in a couple months. So I think in April she's due to come back and see where people are at uh, in terms of Zoom. And for the Planning Commission, we'll just follow suit of what our City Council does. So if they decide to reopen Zoom for public comment, we would too, unless if the Planning Commission 
uh, we, we could discuss that, but that, that's originally what we had agreed to when we cut off the meetings, is we'll just follow suit of City Council. The other item, and I actually incorporated this into our um, agenda this evening, is that the City Council adopted a 30-minute maximum in terms of oral communications made by the public at the very beginning of the meeting during oral communications. It says... Now, a maximum of 30 minutes is set aside for oral communications. Um, I'm sure you've seen or heard some of the trends. There was a really late meeting that occurred at the city of Santa Cruz recently till 4 a.m. Um, I think that was on a, it was definitely on a specific item during communications. But um, this is just to, if we were to have uh, a lot of people come in, um, and want to discuss things during or oral communications that would go beyond a half hour. We could take a raise of hands, see how many people are here for oral communications this evening. And if we see 60 we could, you know, or 30, we could say, okay, you each have one minute to speak on your item just to make it more efficient. Um, and so that was the first item. Wouldn't that be like by project I mean, or, or topic? So by project, we have the three-minute maximum. Um, so by topic, so it's yeah, like this, it, there's there's been a couple cases where um, you know people have come in and oral communications have gone on for like two hours, and it's not about a specific right. project. It's just some some topic. And personally, I think that's a little disingenuous to all the other people. We're here to do business because um, nothing can take place. It's sort of like the Zoom bomb. So what I've seen is cities limited to, you know, 30 minutes for oral communications in the beginning. They often say, we'll continue this at the end of the meeting. So, you know, everybody can have an opportunity to speak. But that way it gives you a chance to go ahead and start your meeting and um, do the, the business that needs to be done that evening rather than have the meeting taken over by something unexpected. Okay. And I think that's why the council did it. They've done it as well. Well, I like the idea of, of having continuing it to the end of the meetings because I can see maybe there are some serious issues that, you know, maybe there's like four different issues and there's a lot of people wanting to talk on all four of them and 30 minutes is going to, they're going to, you know, it might not be enough. So um, I'd say, well, okay, well, you know, we've, we've, we've given you 30 minutes. If you want to wait till the end of the meeting, we'll, we'll throw another 30 minutes at it or hour or whatever. I think that may, I think that and makes I sense. I think we only let somebody speak once for three minutes. Right. Regardless of how much they, how many issues they want to talk about. Um, next is upcoming projects and how we communicate that. Sorry, upcoming projects and how we communicate that to the planning commission. Um, I try to do that during develop uh, the director's report tonight. I actually have got like. During the director's report, I have an update for the next two planning commission meetings, what we're seeing. But I think, Jerry, this was one of your items and if how we could better accommodate. I was just looking at as projects come in um, or discussions come in, you know, so that as planning commission, we could see maybe trends or things that are way far down the line. I think, you know, uh, I have a sense of one just talking about, I think, uh, you know, the uh, alcohol licenses and stuff like that. And, you know, so that when we saw, I don't know, December, whatever it was, you know, for Mijos Tacos, to know, and I think you brought up maybe a concern, like how many do we have and stuff, to know that the city might be talking to potential 10 other applicants that might be bringing them in over the next year and they're looking at different leasing spaces. To have the understanding of a trend or where things are going would be helpful. So, um, and as projects come in, you know, do we see uh, uh, lately a whole bunch of people are uh, checking in with the city and talking about ADUs from a trend or has there been a rush on uh, developers coming in and talking with uh, planning about, you know, potential low-income housing or, you know, 
And so just trying to understand trends more so than um, of looking forward. So I guess I'm trying to be more involved as planning looking forward, um, you know, over the next 12 months um, and maybe not understanding that maybe you don't have a lot of people coming in, but, um, you know, is there trends or are there projects that are coming up that are um, that people are inquiring about or certain properties or something like that um, to better understand that so that can be shared or it can be in our back of our mind as we're looking at projects or um, how things might be changing or what the future looks like. So that's where my comment was around in regarding that. Okay. Um, I can try to incorporate that more into my director's report with trends and um, um, copying us on um, a lot of the high points of city council. Um, I know that a while back we had that the big panel where it was us, you know, and the council member that appointed us. If it, um, it feels, I know that we're always forwarded the agendas and everything, but having the high points summarized is, is really helpful because it gives you context and um, application. You know, like like the Bulb Avenue project, it, it's interesting to talk with council about that stuff because there's there's a history to it and then there's you know all different kinds of detail yeah 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 so the friday update i'll start sending out weekly uh, weekly yeah the other is the chloe sent oh, yeah. out because it always has a summary of what the council took action mm -hmm. on in it that one I do you do you all get that the newsletter the capital wave, yeah, yeah, because that, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think it's just it's nice to have a really succinct summary of the high points of decision making on that level, and even just like upcoming stuff of what, um, what just staff is looking at. Just not even so we can be prepared to make decisions, but just mm -hmm. to give overall context of where the city is going and what to anticipate. And how to kind of keep up with it, you know, how to curate our decision making based, you know, like what Jerry was saying, maybe with hypothetically speaking, just the, the alcohol and the in the bars and stuff like that. Just understanding what the intentions of the city is and being able to make a decision based on that is helpful. Okay. I think like my my example I use it left me, you know, you read in the paper that there's they're gonna start serving alcohol out of the mercantile, you know, at that where little Kehoe's bites or something was, you know, um, knowing that if that was in, you know, like it's already advertised in the newspaper and, um, or an article written about it, and you, no one could control that. But knowing, like, was that project discussed earlier um, in October about that space maybe coming up, and maybe that would have could have skewed the the conversation around. Well, now we're going to give Mijos one. We got one coming in here. Like, just understanding that the flow of projects that are coming in. I guess that's where I was coming from. Okay. Um, next is historic districts, relationship to FEMA, and interest in preservation. And just so you're all aware, within a historic district, when you have a historic district, which we have, I believe, four um, within Capitola, at one point, Depot Hill was looked at, but then didn't become a historic district. Um, the There are leniencies within FEMA for properties within historic districts. So by having our historic districts and um, <laughs> keeping them intact, we have protections on those homes that they can be rebuilt within the floodplain. So um, where in other places, it's uh, not a guarantee. So that was one point, I think, just to make the point that there, there's a true, it's not just historic preservation, but there's also a tie-in for it. It's a real community benefit in that we can keep our historic district around because of the relationship to FEMA. And then um, interest in preservation, and I think this is Susan wanted to discuss. Yeah, I, I brought that up because, um, and I think that's... Um, uh, we see in a lot of the documents it talks about you know preserving Capitola history and um, you know how how people feel about that because I I do think I agree with Katie I think 
keeping the uh, historic districts is important. You know, the six sisters are one, and Lawn Way is one. And if those buildings got destroyed, the only thing that could be rebuilt are buildings that are elevated about 12 to 13 feet above the ground. And um, by preserving our historical districts, we preserve the right to, you know, if they want to, they can rebuild the way they, they are. So I think it's important. We sort of sometimes people poo-poo historical preservation, but um, it does have its place and its benefits here in Capitola. And I will say of our historic districts, the one that's most at risk right now of remaining a historic district is the Riverview Historic District because of um, just how, how many changes have been made. And infill matters in historic districts, what you build in between the historic buildings and how they relate to the historic. Um, you never want them to mimic or copy a historic building, but they should fit within the mass and the setting. So um, we are, at one point, I think Leslie Dill was out and we walked the, the neighborhood and she voiced to me her concern of, you know, this is, we're kind of getting closer. So that, that talk about possible design guidelines in the future, something, something to protect these historic districts is probably um, within our, once we get through some of the implementation that we need to do for the housing element, it should, should be, it's probably, it's, it's definitely on my list of items of things we should be considering in the near future. Um, with that, I'm not prepared to give you a presentation on builder's remedy. That was something that Paul had asked for. And by the time I got to slide 65 <laughs> and sent it out to you all ahead, I said, I, 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 so not ready for the builder's remedy. The one, the quick and the short of it is that Veronica Tam, who we um, rely on heavily, a lot of cities have had a lot of inquiries about builder's remedy. We have not had as, as many inquiries and it's really we do allow housing in all of our zoning districts except for um, industrial and we also require a 15 percent inclusionary where um, builders remedy requires a 20 percent inclusionary so the standard is higher so there's not much of an advantage to going forward with the builders remedy project in capitola as there is in other places where they don't allow housing in commercial areas so um but I'm happy to gather more information on Builder's Remedy, but I'm not prepared tonight. So um, with that, we made it through all our items. I um, thank you all for, your, for bringing these forward and the conversation tonight, very helpful. Just one question with the Builder's Remedy. Um, what's your estimated time until you think that the housing element goes back in? Like how long are we in Builder's Remedy, do you think? Um, great question. So housing element, our next step is that we'd like to move forward with red lines to give to the state. We're asking for a conditional approval in which they would redline the document back and tell us exactly what needs to be modified rather than these back and forth letters. And then we would take that red line version to the city council. We've met with them um, recently, Veronica Tam and her team have been working on the modifications. I told them I do not feel comfortable putting a 75 foot height in until I've taken this to planning commission and city council. So that's really, we're having these two meetings. So after that, I think we're going to proceed with, um, we'll post it on our website, but also submit it to HCD. Um, because if we were to go through the adoption process, there's a six week period and we just, I think um, we're better served that's the big question was the height um, better serve to get that back to the state in terms of not wasting too much time and get it certified sooner. So that's, that is the plan. So crystal ball. Crystal ball. Oh, for, we will, once we get our red lines, we definitely have to um, go through the noticing periods, which it takes about three weeks in advance before a planning commission meeting and then another two weeks in advance before a city council meeting. So once we, it goes 60 days, sorry, 60 days HCD review, redlined comment back, and then it's um, beginning to end probably a two month period for adoption because of noticing requirements. You're hoping sometime this summer, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 120 days.
So from the time we get it in, so that's after the next city council meeting. So, yep. um, so with that, that concludes my presentation. I do have some director report items for you. I, I think it was very helpful, and it was actually kind of like comforting to, to understand where you're all coming from and to get a better perspective and some history. And um, yeah, I feel I feel really good about this conversation. So some some of those items would be like agendized, and you'll bring those back that we had further questions on. Yes. So what will happen next is when I bring them back, they'll be in the form of an ordinance, and we'll have to notice that for public hearing. So we'll draft work on the draft. I do want to have one more work session meeting with the Planning Commission because we have a long list of, um, actually the list got longer, Ben looked at the housing element and went through again. He said, oh, Katie, I found a few more items to add to your list. So um, we've got housing element items and then we also have a list of staff changes that we think need further clarification. Um, so we'd like to do one more work session on that. And I'm thinking a special meeting only because um, it looks like our next two public hearings will be will be plenty of applications. <coughs> so, so I, I have one I think we should think about. My recollection is that we put in the zoning ordinance a requirement that you can't have a motor home parked in front of your property. And now the state has changed that and has said, no, you can you can do that. Oh, I'll have to check. So if that's the case, that's one way we could come up with it in the future. Okay. There there was one more that I thought of recently as well uh, for flat work in front yards. Is that another one that um, of when a permit is required? We have we we. we Oftentimes get calls that people are like paving their front yard. And there's no requirement for a flat work permit. And, but we have all these stormwater requirements. We've got landscaping requirements, but there's no permit. So looking at that as just like an admin check a box. Okay. So I do think it would prevent a lot of the headaches of when we run out to them and say, whoa, what are you doing? Um, okay. Any other items for code related stuff? No. Okay. One thing um, I think I had a lot of conversation with Brian about in the past um, was um, like on demo projects, making sure that there's J number issuance and stuff like that. I think um, you guys have handled that more so from an administrative level. Um, should that be a little bit more defined for applicants when they come in um, about receiving a J number for? Has so its and stuff. We did update um, our information for what's required for a building permit submittal and put that in there. So that's online now. Right. Uh, okay, shall we move on to the director's report? Yes, sorry. Okay. I'm sleeping. Um, okay, I've got a list of items. So first, I'd like uh, the city clerk reminded me today at our staff meeting that. Um, to please complete your form 700 you should have gotten a specific email um, I think it populates what you put in last year so it's pretty easy and if you haven't had any changes but please do that as soon as possible um, I asked her if she could resend the emails to anyone that is still has them out there so that you don't have to go through I know I get plenty of emails on my personal email so no, I I had to request mine uh, the one I filled out last year so she just sent my, it went to spam, but I, I just got it yesterday, I think, so I'll have mine taken care of this week. Let me know if you haven't gotten it, because we can get that for you. Um, and the one she's talking about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's me. Have you done it? I sent it. Have you done Yeah. It's Jerry. It's Jerry. It's our problem. And yeah. Paul. Paul's not here. Okay. <laughs> so I was uh, brainstorming a special meeting date for the next work session. Um, I was wondering if we could look at calendars for that. And I've got the availability here. I'm thinking um, February 15th may be too soon. That is, 
of an open Thursday, but um, there's our next meeting is um, is March seventh. Yeah, the twenty second we have a city council meeting. Maybe uh, the nineteenth looks like it's open for. That's a Monday, the nineteenth. Monday the nineteenth is President's. Oh yeah, that's not a good. Um, it's a holiday. City Hall's closed that day. City Hall's closed that day. Um, would the fifteenth work for folks if? If Ben and I can get it all together before then, I think it would be kind of informal like this. If we would, uh, we're not going to draft anything for it, but just bring the, um, let you know, know what the issue is and what we need to get done and get some like in the fifteenth of February. Fifteenth of February, would that work? I can make it work. Courtney, does that work for you? Okay, let's tentatively place it for the 15th. Um, we will also um, be probably putting together a special meeting for the 1098 38th Avenue project, which is the affordable housing project, and we were tentatively looking at April 18th. Um, so if you could let me know if that doesn't work, and then we can look for other dates. Otherwise, if you could that hold that in your calendar April 18th I probably will not be able to make that I, my daughter's expecting that day oh. where are your priorities Peter no, I'm just <laughs> and will there be more discussion about that project then? no I think that would be the first time that it would make it to Planning Commission there's quite a few studies being done we can look at other dates though if, if it doesn't work. So it sounds like well, I'll put out an email because it's that far out in advance. Okay. Um, strategic plan, I had told you there will be a presentation um, to city council next week. The zero emission pa passenger rail and trail next week on February 8th. Um, one update is that the Cliff Drive Resiliency Project has begun, where they're looking at long-term solutions to preventing further erosion on the bluff and Cliff Drive. So we're expecting, um, I believe we're looking at future community meetings, possibly the last week of February. So I think Jessica's working with the consultant right now to figure out a schedule, but there'll be a community meeting trying to get public input on just um, the issues and possible solutions for Cliff Drive. So you can look forward to that the week of the 25th of February. Um, and then upcoming applications that we've, we've received at the March 7th meeting, I'm going to give an update on our housing program and just kind of the overall housing element what we saw for development in the last year, because our um, numbers are due to the state, and then what we what our program is for the upcoming year in order to get items accomplished that are required under the new housing element. Um, we have an application right across the street uh, on our favorite block of redevelopment, 413 Capitola Avenue. It's the single family white, it was uh, Richard Amy's office it's actually not a single family right now. It's supposed to be an office. Um, converting that to a single family home with the living on the second story and outside the floodplain. That will be coming before you. Um, 203 Fanmar. Will, it, there's an addition, second story addition. And then also the Capitola Wharf design modification and the modification to the CDP. So that will be coming back to you. Um, then looking ahead to April 4th. The Mercantile, we've received an application for um, a tasting room for a beer tasting, as well as they want to utilize another suite so that people can buy their goods to, to go. So, um, And then 700 Hill, this is the hotel site. They 
in looking for financing, they need to split that lot so that they're, they can be sold individually in the future, having a hard time getting financing without the lot split. So most likely a lot split will be on the agenda for April 4th, and then 210 Fanmar, which is also proposing an addition. So a lot going on in the Fanmar neighborhood. Um, and then that that's all I've got, and I really appreciate all your input tonight. Thank you. Uh, question: Can you, could you hear anything more about the rumor mill of the from Central Fire about fire station locations and stuff? So I, I did. Um, I understand that the the produce market. I don't think it's that site. I think the produce market was given the opportunity to buy that site, so they're actually like reinvesting into their. Um, I, I ran into the sister of the previous owner the other day, and so she said there, the owner there um, is reinvesting in that site. So from what I can tell, I think I, I have not heard from Central Fire direct, but I directly, but I think it would be the possibly the bank site. Um, but I'm not sure. Bank, the, the bank, bank, in the bank, possibly if it's at that corner. Um, there's some community surveying going on about fire station location. I, I will, I'll, I'll call and ask about that. I, now. Sean, is there any interest from in and out on that? Do you? I, we haven't received any inquiries from in and out or even a fast food. We've received some inquiries <laughs> about that site, but none, none for a, a fast food chain. Coffee? Coffee was one. Yeah. And it sounds like that might be out. Is that it for the director's report? That is. Okay, so I think we're adjourned. Is that Until March. March 7th, 2024. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you can't.